Nadia Combs, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through adults in our workforce program. I'm Henry Shake Washington, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America, and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. Our district is diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. Meetings are also streamed live on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archive. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They are posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape our community's future. The board meeting of August 22nd, 2023 is called to order. Member Washington will now lead us in a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Please stand for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. <clears throat> Member Washington will now Will you please acknowledge our student entertainment? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. A wonderful band is coming in now. Uh, I would like to thank the Bloomingdale High School drum line, along with Principal Marcus Rodriguez, band director John Jordan Fraze, and drum instructor Bennett Brown. These wonderful students entertained us prior to the start of the board meeting. At this point, I would like for them to come up and introduce themselves. And you remind me when I was in high school that I would almost start dancing out there. Van, come on up. Hello, I am Natalia Longstreth. I'm in ninth grade and I play the snare drum. Okay. Hi, my name is Sammy Camp. I'm in 11th grade and I play the tenors. Hi, I'm Allison Kennedy. I'm 11th grade and I play the cymbals. Hi, I'm Cooper Shelley. I'm in ninth grade and I play the cymbals. Hi, I'm Elsie Owen. I'm in 10th grade and I play third bass. I'm Emmanuel Henry. I'm 9th grade and I play cymbals. Hello, my name is Alexandra Okendo. I'm a junior and I play the tenors. I'm Caitlin Pena. I'm 9th grade and I play fourth bass. Jessica Cooper. I'm 9th grade and I play cymbals. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Walters. I'm in 10th grade and I play bass drum. My name is Owen Valdez. I'm a senior. I play the bass drum. I'm the drum captain. After I graduate, I plan to join the Air Force Academy. Cool. I'm Eli Cantrell, I'm in 10th grade and I play the tenors. Thomas Jones, I'm a senior, I play the tenors, I want to go to UCF when I graduate. Right. My name is Tucker Heldreth, I'm a junior and I'm the snare captain. Hello, my name is Braden Alvarez, it's my first year in snare and I'm a junior, thank you. I'm Michael Monet, I'm a junior and I play snare drum. I'm Keegan Riley Arbogast, I'm also a drum captain, I'm a senior and I want to go to business school. Hi, I'm Andre Williams. I'm a senior. I play the cymbals, and I plan to go to culinary school after this. Oh, yeah. My name is Samuel Robert Harrison. I'm a senior. I play snare drum. 
I'm going to go to FSU and then I'm going to run for president in 2044. All right. All right. Go Knowles. <laughs> I am Major Preventer. I am a senior on baseline, and I plan to go to pre-med track in college. Right. I'm Bennett Brown. I am the percussion instructor for Bloomingdale. Hi there. My name is Jordan Fraze. I'm the band director for Bloomingdale High School. I want to say thank you so much to all of you who continue to support music in our schools. And as a token of our gratitude and the drumline's gratitude, we have brought you a gift. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aww. If we have any parents wanting to come up and take pictures, you can. These guys are so tall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy. As they like to say, go Bulls. Thank you so much. That was an amazing way to start our meeting. That was wonderful. We have no withdrawn items today. I need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member Gray. I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Let the record reflect that all board members are present. We have two sets of minutes to be approved today. July 25th, 2023, school board meeting, August a 2023 school board meeting. I need a motion, a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Member Perez. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Board members, I'd like to go over the format of today's meeting. As a reminder, we're a nonpartisan board who believe that all children can be empowered to learn to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have five minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Member Washington will now read the board guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. There are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed with closed caption on live webcasts, on cable TV, on video monitors here in the auditorium. It also can be viewed with closed caption in the online video archives. Thank you. We have one item scheduled for time certain, and that's 6 o'clock, and that will be employee input. We will now move to public comment. The board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and will keep our board informed about the decisions. Our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board, comments are not directed personally against a board member or staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. This afternoon, each speaker will have three minutes. Reminder that your three minutes start when you begin speaking. When there are 30 seconds left, you'll see a yellow light on the lectern. A red light and a chime will indicate when your time is up. I'd like to first now call up the first five speakers. And our first speaker today, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Susan Virginia Davis, 
And I wanted to thank the three members that voted for just, uh, Washington, Vaughn, and Perez. I appreciate your support for just. And uh, I'm curious about how many teacher vacancies are happening now. And I don't know whether there's AC problems in classrooms, but 14, 12 years ago, I also suffered with many hot classrooms and listening to kids complain and suffer many hours without air conditioning, many, many different schools. It wasn't one school. Um, and I know they're voluntarily mandatory half to 10 schools, these children. And in prisons, Florida is known for not having AC in the prisons. So uh, our children deserve at least AC. Um, I don't know if the contract's been settled. I hope so. And I haven't heard any reports in the news about COVID. I don't know if COVID's in the school or not, but it's in my neighborhood. So I'm terrified of COVID. That's why I always wear mask. Um, I'm a high risk person. And I'm a little older than most of you or all of you. <laughs> so I'm real susceptible. <laughs> so I'm really terrified of COVID. So I used to stay out of restaurants. Now I'm risking my life to have a good meal. But um, I appreciate how good this board is and your support for the the school that I supported. And I, I appreciate the good work you all are doing. So thank you very much for your time and letting me speak. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. I'm Teresa Potter, president of the League of Women Voters of Hillsborough and Pasco counties and a longtime public education advocate. I'm a former media specialist, former county PTA legislative chair, and have become an expert in state public education funding. We decided it was important to speak today because our public school parents need to know the facts about House Bill 1, which expands the private school voucher program. There's a lot of confusion in our community. First, it's important to know how we got here. In 2006, Florida was 23rd in the nation in per-student funding. In 2006, the Florida taxpayer paid $76 million for private school vouchers. The program was new, implemented in 2001 with tight spending caps. By 2009, the spending caps have doubled. Public school per-student funding drops to 40th in the nation. By 2018, exponential spending cap increases have been approved. Income limits have been increased and $700 million in taxpayer funds are paying for vouchers. In 2018, per student funding is now at 44th in the nation and teacher salaries are down to 47th. In spring 2020, when many were distracted by so many other things, the voucher program was expanded again. By the 2022-23 school year, $2.5 billion in taxpayer money were awarded to private schools through the now four separate voucher programs. And Florida public school teacher salaries are now ranked 48th in the nation, with only teachers in South Dakota and West Virginia making less. In Hillsborough County alone, over $100 million went to vouchers last year, and our public schools saw mass layoffs and continued reductions in student services and course offerings. When House Bill 1 was passed a few months ago, income limits and student caps were removed from vouchers. As of this past Friday, 25,854 applications, or approximately $206 million in vouchers, have already been awarded in Hillsborough County, double the amount awarded in all of last school year. It is now obvious there is not a cap of 20,000 students for the whole state since we have nearly 26,000 in Hillsborough alone. It is understandable that there was some confusion on that since there are multiple voucher programs. Now would be a good time to Google Florida Policy Institute HB1 summary so you can follow along. These are the four programs. Number one, FTC, the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship, the original. Number two, the FESUA, the Florida Empowerment Scholarship for Unique Abilities. Number three, FESEO, the Florida Empowerment Scholarship for Education Options. And four, the HOPE Scholarship created under the bullying bill. One has a cap of 20,000 students and one has a cap of 26,500. But if you don't qualify for one of those, you're automatically switched over to the one pot of money that has no cap. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, I'm Luann Tolbert. I'm with League of, Women, League of Women Voters and a retired educator with over 30 years of experience in this school district. I will continue sharing facts about the impact of HB1. The expansion of school vouchers is creating an untenable situation where all the dollars follow the student, but not all the costs. There is no way to hold our public schools harmless. Our public schools have fixed costs for buildings, sports facilities, and utilities. There will be ongoing budgetary uncertainty since schools cannot prepare for the movement of students who can leave at any time and come back at any time. The dollars are paid out quarterly, but public schools might take that student back on the second day of the quarter after the funds for that quarter have gone to a private school or to a parent if it's a PEP student. We know that the 10-day count to calculate school enrollment will take place tomorrow, but we are hearing that enrollment is down in many of our schools. If enrollment is down, what is the contingency plan to cover our fixed costs? If the state is holding school districts harmless, are they covering these fixed costs separately? The taxpayer costs are estimated to grow to over $4 billion this year. None of this money is going to public schools across the state. But the state has long required public schools to pay for services for, for, for services for students at private or charter schools that don't offer the same services. Are those students who decide to join a public school, school team as they are now allowed to do, required to pay for their uniform, their equipment? Do they contribute to the cost of facilities or are they guaranteed a spot on the team? I don't think there are any private schools that charge seven to eight thousand dollars, seven to eight thousand dollars per student and provide all the services of our public schools, including science labs for middle and high school, sports, band, and transportation. Private schools don't pay for dual enrollment courses for their students. Their tuition has been free, but doesn't the public school district pay the dual enrollment costs for private school students? Is that changing now that private school is receiving state taxpayer dollars? AP testing is another issue. Yes, the state pays for the tests. In Hillsborough County last year, that was over 26,500 exams at a cost of over over $95 per test. How many more students will take advantage of earning free college credits at the taxpayer's expense and show up to be tested in public high schools this May? In Hillsborough County alone, costs for vouchers are expected to triple to at least $300 million from just the FES arm of the voucher system. Imagine what that, those funds could do for our public thank, school thank students you. and thank our you. teachers. Thank, thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. My name is Damaris Allen. I'm a public school advocate, and for the first time in a very long time, I don't have a kid in Hillsborough County Public Schools, and I will not cry about it. <laughs> Although I want to deeply. I want to talk to you about two things. First, HB1. I spent an enormous amount of time in Tallahassee last session following this bill, rereading it hundreds of times, unfortunately, all 100 pages, and I want to talk about a few things. One is the personalized education plan. That came out of homeschool parents being concerned that they didn't want limits on what they could do. They didn't want parameters. And so they created this personalized education plan that was open to 20,000 students. That 20,000 students will increase by 40,000 next year and 40,000 the year after after until the cap is completely removed in 2027. So personalized education programs will have no limit in 2027. They can use that funding and this, you can find this on the AAA, on AAA scholarship funding website, can be used to purchase things like trampolines, theme park tickets, and in-ground pools. I'm not making that up. I'll be happy to send you the website. Also, it's really important to note that students who choose to attend private schools waive their federal protections when it comes to students with disabilities. Private schools are not required to follow their IEPs. Um, and why don't I just read directly from the bill? A parentally placed private school student with a disability does not have an individual right to receive some or all of the special education related services that the student would receive 
if enrolled in a public school under the Individuals with Disabilities Act. And if you're curious about where that came from, if you look under the enrolled text in the bill, it's in line 1925 to 1930, because it sounds so absurd that we wouldn't protect our students with disabilities with our tax number dollars that I wanna make sure you can go back and check to make sure I'm just not pulling that out of thin air. Now, the last numbers we saw said that there were 390 voucher applications coming through Step Up for Students. It's one of two voucher funding uh, funding uh, uh, SFOs, uh, funding organizations, sorry. Um, the other one is AAA. They tend to have less. The governor suggested that we had 410 applications, so obviously caps are remo removed. Prior to this year, we were on a path to where caps would have been removed. 375% of the income level of the poverty level is who was, uh, was ad, uh, eligible prior to this year, and that would have increased by 25%. Every year, the, the threshold wasn't met. So we were already on this path. Now we're just on a faster trip towards this path. The other thing I want to talk about is please keep discussion. Let's talk about books. Like the ability for us to have an honest, open discussion and have con conflict in a safe space is really important. Please don't take that part of the process away. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, if speakers six through 10 could also please line up. Board members, thank you for the opportunity to provide feedback today. My name is Trisha Long. I'm a Hillsborough County resident, and I am the parent of two public school students. I came here today to provide feedback as a parent and as a person who likes Shakespeare about the recent decision to teach only excerpts of Shakespeare and other great writers to our high school students, rather than the works in their entirety. To say that I am disappointed in this decision is a vast understatement. Our children are exposed to so many media experiences that lack context and encourage a short attention span. I'm confused about how we think that they will benefit from the TikTok version of literature. In the past several years, this board has spoken over and over again about how important it is to attract students to public schools, especially when they have many other options as the previous speakers have been describing. We've talked about the great need to encourage critical thinking in our students to prepare them to be engaged and informed citizens. These are worthy goals, and I believe this decision will have the opposite effect. We will not attract students into public schools by reducing our classroom discussions in the name of teaching to the test. We will not attract parents who want their children to think critically by teaching only material that is guaranteed not to offend anyone. We will not attract people who value theater and art because their children cannot discuss or read the full context of great literature in class. We will not attract qualified, experienced teachers who love to discuss the complexities of these works with students. Who exactly would be attracted to a public school system where the aim is to prepare students for testing rather than for life? Mark Twain said, censorship is telling a man he can't have a steak because a baby can't chew it. In censoring Shakespeare in high school, we fool no one when we pretend that we are reading to babies and not educating young adults. This policy is an embarrassment to our district, in my opinion. It should be rescinded and rethought. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Chase Hartman. I'm a Sickles at Senior High School, or a senior at Sickles High School, and the founder of an award-winning book distribution project called Read Repeat and a nonprofit called Eco Brothers. I'm here to give my thoughts on the recent issues regarding challenged and banned books, not only from my perspective as a teen, but also as someone who has collected and donated 220,000 new and used books and given them to more than more than 65,000 students in Hillsborough County Public Schools over the last seven years. I started this project when I was 10 when I realized many kids in this county didn't own books of their own. So I set out to help. I began by donating used books, but quickly real realized that we are a diverse county and kids need access to diverse books. So I began raising funds to supply students with books of diversity. However, recent Florida legislation has introduced significant challenges. These laws have ushered in stringent assessments of materials and specifically targeted books that discuss gender identity, sexual orientation, and race, often stripping students of essential perspectives and insights. 
Last fall, I received a grant for 10K to purchase books with diversity and three little free libraries for area schools. In the spring, many schools canceled my deliveries in fear of not being able to properly vet the donation of these age-appropriate books, and I was unable to place all of the previously requested little free libraries because the schools were fearful that they could not control the content. The students who would normally receive books to keep and read over the summer were left with nothing. I'm concerned that students like me are being deprived of characters of all backgrounds and gender, gender identities. I ask you to understand that books like The Hate You Give for high school students and two recently flagged books in my deliveries, What Was Stonewall and Who Was Harvey, Harvey Milk about the history of LGBTQ, LGBTQ rights help students understand themselves, others, and develop inclusivity and acceptance. I agree, parents, officials, and yes, even students should have an input in what we read, but in a country where half of the students are, or in a county where half of the students are testing below proficiency, I think we need to place more awareness on reading and less on micromanaging content out of fear of those who are different. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Carmen Edmonds, and I'm here to talk about the Seven Mindsets curriculum that is being considered as supplemental social and emotional learning for Hillsborough County Schools. This curriculum is among the many that are considered to be in violation of parental rights and education due to the topics of social emotional learning being discussed in a classroom setting. Teachers are not certified therapists or counselors. They went to school to teach and therefore teachers should be given back their classrooms to do things like actually teaching important core curriculum. Our schools nationwide are failing and falling behind globally in areas concerning math, reading, science, and history. SEL curriculum has been used in Chicago for 10 years and their math score proficiencies has decreased 62% and their reading proficiency has decreased 49%. Why do we want to adopt this curriculum yet again when we have our own failing schools that have only been using this curriculum for three years? Why would we want to keep using this curriculum that is shown to lower scores when we have high schools that are not even operating at 50% 50 50 proficiency in math and reading? For example, Hillsborough High School reading proficiency 48%, math 30%. Gaither High School reading 48%, math 30%. Freedom High School reading 23%, math 39%. Chamberlain High School reading 20%, math 23%. And those are just a small sample. If your motto is to prepare students for life, how is renewing this failing curriculum achieving that goal? We are failing our students if this curriculum passes again. Each of you who votes to renew this contract is complicit in the failing grades of our schools. You will be showing your true colors that you would rather have woke policies and curriculum than actually helping prepare our students for life, for jobs, for trade schools, for college, for raising families, for being productive members of our society. None of this can be achieved when they cannot do basic age-appropriate math or reading at appropriate age levels. Social emotional learning does not prepare our children for the future. It purposely creates a victim mentality. It does not teach about taking personal responsibility, hard work, or that each student can actively participate in determining their own destinies. This curriculum must not be renewed. SEL curriculum has, been, has a 10-year test rate in Chicago that proves it is a failed curriculum. Why would we do this to our children? Why would we waste our time and our tax dollars on something that is not working? Please vote no to renew this curriculum. And just like some of the ladies from League of Women Voters were saying, there's a problem with people leaving our public schools here in Hillsborough County. And maybe if we got back to teaching the basics, the core, reading, writing, math curriculum, working on raising some of these scores in our schools, you wouldn't have such an outflow of school from our public school systems, and you would have parents that would put their kids back in our public schools because they're getting a quality education and not a watered down education. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, members, and thank you for your time hearing public comment. I'm Sharon Graham Barrett. I'm a former HCPS teacher. I'm an 11 year resident of Hillsborough County and a therapist um, who owns a private practice here. Uh, I have spent um, several hours reviewing the Seven Mindsets curriculum, and I've also heard from um, colleagues who have used it um, about their experience with it, and every single one spoke very highly um, of 
you know, improvements that they saw within their students. Just want to be very specific about that. And I'd like to speak to um, the two data points that the previous speaker referenced um, out of Chicago. Um, that is a misrepresentation, uh, misapplied analysis of that data. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I know you have experts on staff who can speak more to that, um, so I'll move on. But um, I'm also here as a Christian. I'm pointing that out because I've heard there is religious-based opposition to the approval of the seven mindsets. I would just like to point out three things on that front. The first is that there's nothing in this curriculum that um, contradicts the foundations of any major religion and no way in which it infringes on the rights of parents to teach their children what they would like. Two, there are um, the individuals who are opposing this, ironically because it um, teaches social and emotional elements, which are all throughout major religious works, um, are the same ones yelling, bring back prayer in our schools. Um, as we know, it never left. We allow and invite everyone to pray and meditate each morning, which is a beautiful practice. Um, so to advocate this and then deny approval of this wonderful curriculum um, because it teaches, excuse me, it teaches social and emotional elements does not follow logic. <laughs> Thirdly, um, the requirement, the Florida requirement slash rule that this excellent curriculum fulfills includes in part, quote, responsible decision making, resiliency, relationship skills, and conflict resolution, and understanding and respecting other viewpoints and backgrounds. And that is precisely why we should approve this excellent curriculum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, uh, next speaker, and if we could have speakers 11 through 13, please line up. Good afternoon. My name is Tina Williams Brewster. Um, I've been in Hillsborough County Schools now, June 1st, eight years. Once again, I'd like to come before you regarding ESC resources for students. Um, right before the meeting, I was able to read ESC staff, they have to have a master's degree. They also have to have special education and certification. Wow, all these experts, and yet we lack communication. According to Hillsborough County's own school policies, if a parent reaches out, it should be 48 hours for a response. While we all know that it's back to school, once again, Hillsborough County Schools, where's the standard? I should not, have, as a parent, have to go outside of the building just to be able to communicate with ESC staff. I'm capable, I'm very rehearsed, just like these ESC staff and personnel have a master's degree in education, I have the equivalent of a PhD on my child. We have got to do better with our ESC students. It's just like the delicate cycle. We all have laundry, we don't wash the laundry all the same. Each tag represents something different, just like our students. Federal law doesn't say three weeks that services begin. It's day one. This is not rocket science. We do this over and over again. Every year, the delays for services get further and further and further behind. What, what does the staff do during the summertime? All I hear is excuses. When is Hillsborough County going to do better? Where's the standard? Our students come prepared. They're giving it all that they have. Staff, personnel, let's do the same. So I know you know the law if you have to have all this credentialing. So is it by choice to ignore parents? I've got news for you. We're not going anywhere. Like I love the lady's shirt who said, Stay in trouble, the good kind of trouble. That's the motto I live by. We don't give you our junk. My daughter has special needs, but guess what? I still hold her to a level. I'm proud of her. She has a 3.8 GPA. The least you could do is communicate with the parents about a problem. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
Hello. Alan Brewster. The first thing I want to say is the school, the school personnel, the leadership at the school, the student, and the parents should be a partnership. It should not be a dictatorship. If there's an issue with staff or the leadership, when the parent sends an email about the issue, it should be addressed. Parents should not have to go out of the building to get an issue addressed. And you have student personnel avoiding the emails. We've sent several emails with no response, several. And we requested a IEP meeting with no response. Then we were told that it could only be on this day. I have other responsibilities. We're not available that day, but we're, they were adamant. It's gonna happen that day or no other day. That's not a partnership. First of all, the parents and the student did cause the issue. The school did. Second of all, you, I don't have to accommodate the school. I'm, they're at work. I'm not. They should accommodate the student and the parents for the meeting. And it's like, I've been telling them this for eight years and they still don't get it because they don't understand what partnership is. If a parent says they're not available and they give you the dates that's available, then it's up to the school to make it happen and not refuse to make it happen. And that's what's happening at Gaither High School. It's the leadership. The leadership needs to change. It, we're not the only parents that are experiencing this failure at that school. It's the leadership. And how long is it going to take to make a change? 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? What about the students? Put the students first. The students come first, not the principal, not the teachers, nobody else. The, the students does. And they need to understand that. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'm here today because I care about our community, especially our children. When my sons were in high school, two of them were at Middleton. Mr. Washington and Ms. Whalen may remember that. I was there frequently helping the teachers and staff any way I could, and I was especially helpful with the soccer team. I knew a lot of them, if they left school, couldn't come back for the soccer, uh, for the game, so I'd have them over to my house, not just to make sure they had dinner, but for fellowship. So I deeply care about our children. One of my sons, not these two, another one had a drug addiction problem. In order to help him and the community, I went and got my master's in mental health. Most parents don't attend these meetings because one, they don't have time, and two, they're afraid if they come up here and speak, there'll be repercussion with their children. But that doesn't mean they don't care. I'm gonna be honest, the ESL program wasn't something I was overly familiar with, but I've spent the last week and many more hours than I'd like to admit trying to wrap my head around it and better understand it. And I got several friends that said it's, it's, it's okay. So I took a step back and I examined it through my eyes of, of a mental health counselor and how these would impact. So I started asking myself questions. One was who's gonna teach the lesson and it looks like the teacher is, but then I also felt like we really need a mental health counselor in each of those because the teacher in 10 minutes, as it says for prep, that's not enough time for the teacher to really have the knowledge they need. Two, why is it online, especially for elementary, it seems like they would need booklets to write in, and then they could take it home with their parents and share. But most importantly, some of the topics may be like hitting a hornet's nest with a bat for some of these children, causing triggers that even the child might be unaware of. Do the teachers have the time and knowledge to help get the child the assistance they need, or to even identify it? And at what point is a parent going to be contacted? Many times children, and even adults, get triggered by something and they don't even know why they're upset. We really need professional help. Are you gonna be hiring more mental health counselors? And then the responses online, who's gonna monitor them? 
What if a family struggling with cancer, death, divorce, unhealthy siblings, or if the child had an argument with their parents before the program that day? Many families have chosen to deal with some of these topics other, in other ways than what this program is going to teach. So are the responses going to be monitored or just the data being collected? Who's responsible to follow up with the program? Are social services going to be called if someone says something about suicide? When are the parents going to be contacted? In general, utilizing these programs seems to be as though the school is attempting to assume a role of a parent instead of staying dedicated to their core objective of delivering solid academic education. Please consider the questions I've raised and try to answer them when you're going through this. It, this is really serious. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Chandra Jones. I am a disaster case manager with St. Vincent de Paul, and I have a young grandchild who attends Turner Bar Tales. Um, I live in the area, and I, this kind of diverges from anything specific with the school district, but I wanted to, I've noticed lately that we are getting more and more cases of families who are still displaced or don't have adequate housing because of Hurricane Ian. And this is a new program that's funded by FEMA, and I just wanted to come up here and just introduce it to you all, and maybe you can pass it on if you know any survivors who are of need of assistance. Um, we, we contract with businesses and other resources and agencies within the community. We have Hillsborough County, we have all the surrounding counties that we are working with. We work with other agencies like the Red Cross. Um, we're all in a partnership now because, of course, the emergency funding that was here to help those families after Hurricane Ian has ended, and now we have to come in and kind of pick up the pieces of the people who were not didn't receive everything that they needed. So I just wanted to impart that information, um, and I wanted to let, if, if anyone knows of anyone who is a survivor and they still need assistance, if you could please just contact us. The number is 941-799-6779, and it's just an outreach number so that they can get in touch with resources to help them. So, thank you. Thank you, and our final speaker for today? Good afternoon, members of the board. I'm speaking today about the implementation of another SEO curriculum, the Seven Mindsets, that's being voted on today. This is the third one in the past few months with Second Step and Panorama prior to this. This curriculum is building a common language, and I quote from their website, the curriculum provides students and educators with an engaging, accessible, common language to support lasting, tangible change. If they're teaching a common language between the teacher and the student, where do the parents come in? Do they have the option to opt in or opt out of this? If they don't, then it undermines the parental rights. In 2020, CASEL updated their definition of SEL to say a school family community partnership addresses various forms of inequity and contributing to just societies, which in other words, the broad scope of impact of SEL is being used to create systemic change in society. The Seven Mindsets curriculum aligns with the CASEL core competencies as do all 85 SEL curricula. Another issue is the expertise of those performing the mental health services in conjunction with this curriculum. It was already mentioned that teachers and the staff that are being trained do not have mental health training, nor do they know what to do if a, if a student triggers from the information being taught. I'm already being told that throughout the district, teachers are being removed from their classes for 30 minutes a week so someone can come in and teach the SEL program second step. I was surprised to find when I had dug previously on sec second step that it uses the National Equity Project as a re resource for schools through the second step program. I read in your package that Seven Mind Steps has increased academic performance, mental wellness, positive classroom behavior, and educational equity. 
it's interesting that this very same verbiage is used on the Seven Mindsets website. It's also quoted in some articles about Seven Mindsets and about Castle SEL in general. But for some reason, I can't find a lot of information that gives specific improvements to students' proficiency scores when I look for them, except for the information that um, I had previously seen on Chicago. That's a huge red flag for me when it's all of the language is great language, but there aren't specific results that can be tabulated. It's your duty to not only advocate for every student's well-being, but to do everything in your power to protect them and ensure they are equipped with the appropriate tools for a successful future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our public comment for today. We will now move on to the recognition and proclamations. We have three recognitions today. We won't be voting on any of them, but board members feel free to comment. We'll start with the recognition of Hillsborough County Schools Florida Department of Education 2023 Commissioner's Business Partner Recognition Award, CBR, CBRA recipients, and I'll be highlighting this recognition today. The Commissioner's Business Recognition Award recognizes Florida school districts and business partners that have demonstrated outside, outstanding commitments to students by encouraging positive change. The Commissioner's Business Recognition Award program serves to highlight educational connections that force strong community and family involvement in Florida schools and help promote student success. These educational connections help Florida school districts gain a competitive edge in providing enhanced services to the students they serve. Award recipients that have been submitted to the Florida Department of Education to represent our school districts are, first is Idlewild Baptist Church, Yerusha Munag, nominated by the Transformation, Transformation Network, Recycled Tunes, Tad Denham, nominated by Tracy Lisi, Music Supervisor, Academic Services, and finally, Suncoast Credit Union, Courtney Berry, nominated by Anne Marie Courtney, Director of Partnership Engagement. Board members, you stand? Oh, maybe we should get down. We should go downstairs. We'll go down. We're good. Yeah, I think either. See, you got a small eye. You know <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess they're not. Oh, should we? Are we going to make comments? Should we make comments? No, no comments. And on behalf of the school board, we really thank all of you and for your partnership. We really appreciate each and every one of these organizations. Thank you. Next is AO2, Adopt a Hillsborough County Teacher. Member Vaughn will be highlighting this recognition. Thank you. Um, I am very excited to have the honor to be able to recognize Adopt a Teacher um, and the founder, Brooke Elkins. In July 2020, Ms. Brooke Elkins created the Adopt a Hillsborough Teacher Facebook page. Along with HCPS educators Laura Gilman and Emily Lee, as well as HCPS parent and local realtor Jennifer Abadi, Hope I said that right. Thousands of teachers have had their classroom supplies needs provided for by numerous community members. This initiative has demonstrated the unity in our collective community. The school board and interim superintendent Ayers want to acknowledge and thank the continued efforts of Ms. Elkins in supporting our educators. She is truly a community champion who supports our mission of preparing students for life. Thank you for making us Hillsboro strong. I don't think we're going to do comments. I don't think we're going to do comments on it. Thank you. You're 
are amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. On, on behalf of the school board and thousands of teachers, thank you so much. Okay. The next recognition is the AO3 recognition of Keisha Parham's leadership and contribution to HAPSPE, Hillsborough Alliance of Black School Educators, and the Black History Brain Bowl. Deputy Superintendent of Academics and Transformation, Member Gray, will be highlighting this recognition. Yes. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wanted to read, and I, I shared with uh, Ms. Parham that the, the reason I'm reading this is because she has done such a comprehensive job uh, in expanding the Black History, his, uh, Bra Black History Brain Bowl. Um, and I don't say this lightly. Um, Ms. Parham, you have delighted us. You have stimulated the students. You've motivated them to do their best to learn about the black history culture, African-American studies. You have built this uh, plane and it is flying strong. So uh, if you'll just give me a moment and then Sheikh and I would like to give you something, member of Washington and I, excuse me. Kingship Parham served as president for Hapsby, Hillsborough Alliance of Black School Educators from August 2019 to June 2023. One of her initial contributions to the organization was the continuation of Black, <coughs> excuse me, District's Black History Brain Bowl, established in 2016 with 10 participating schools and 50 students. Now, this is going to go uh, way increase here in a moment. The goal of the Black History Brain Bowl is to provide an opportunity for students to learn about black history, including African and local history and a chance to collaborate and learn with peers. In 2020, the African American Task Force, sparked by a collaboration between education, uh, educational advocate Fred Hearns and myself, uh, and now Sheikh Washington, member Washington, sought to further champion African American history in that year. The black and in that year, the Black History Brain Bowl went district wide to include now 40 schools and around 200 middle and high school students. Now, in 2022, elementary students entered the Black History Brain Bowl, now making this event a true elementary to high school initiative. This past year, under the leadership of Ms. Parham, the Black History Brain Bowl had almost 100 schools, now this is compared to 10, 100 schools, 490 students, 200 team coaches, 100 volunteers, and cross-departmental participation awarding over $10,000 in prizes. And Member Washington, if I'm not mistaken, also contributed. I did a little bit, but, uh, and Fred Hearns. We want to thank Ms. Parham for her leadership and service to not only Hapsi, but to the students and to those schools. Uh, and Chris Jargo, as, as I know he's in the audience, Chris, you might as well stand too, because Kingsha knows, Ms. Parham knows that you have been one of the great conductors of that big orchestra that you put together. Um, and with that, uh, Member Washington, would you do the pleasure? We're going to do that. American History Task Force plaque for your years of service and given to our students. So thank you very much and we'll see you. You did a great job. Thank you. You're gonna miss you. Yes, sir. There you go. Uh, can we take a pic uh, photo? Photo. Okay. <laughs> board? Yeah.
Thank you, and thank you for all the work on behalf of the board. I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Gray, and I have a second by Member Hahn. Please vote when your lights appear. Combs, Combs is first. One, two. And it passes unanimously. The following items will now be heard. C-102, C-103, C-202, C-705, C-706, C-714, and C-1001. 102, Proposed Hillsborough County Public Schools Uniform Testing Calendar for the 2023-2024 school calendar. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is a yearly requirement from all school districts. Uh, each school district mu must complete this uniform testing calendar with district-required assessment information, publish the calendar to the district website, and provide it to the uh, Florida Department of Education by October of each school year. Per Florida statute, the district is now following the new best standards and administering the associated Florida Assessment of Student Thinking FAST assessments. Per Florida statute, students in grades K-12 cannot spend more than 5% of instructional seat time minutes on testing. The proposed 23-24 calendar meets this requirement. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-102. I have a motion, a motion by Member Hahn. I have a second by Member Washington. Um, I pulled this item. If anybody else has any comments? Oh, it's not working. Okay. Sorry, it's just not working. Um, I just had a couple questions and comments. I really do appreciate um, testing and measurement, making sure that we're staying below the state threshold. But one of the things that I have said over and over again, that I do think there's increased testing coming from the Department of Education. It concerns me. I do think that we have to test students. We want to see where they are. But the amount of testing that's occurring um, at a very young level from kindergarten and continuing to test those students is a concern to me. And I also, as I said, I really appreciate um, Hillsborough County Public Schools making sure we stay below that threshold. But my concern is still the increased amount of testing. When you're not seeing that testing in other venues as well, we're not seeing that type of requirement from other places that are receiving some of those vouchers. At the end of the day, I support parent choice, but I want to make sure that there's oversight, that we make sure that people who are spending their tax dollars to send a child to a school, that they make sure that those students are getting an adequate edu education. My other concern is with iReady. Um, uh, not I ready. Yes, I ready. I'm very concerned at the amount of testing. I know we've used that program for many, many years. I haven't seen that pendulum swim swing academically. If you look at our scores for the last six years in elementary education, they've moved, but they have not moved as much as they need to. And we continue to test students. And I think there's many schools that have that message that I ready is a requirement. So I'm going to continue to say over and over, it is not a requirement. That is only just one picture, and I say this with absolute conviction because I ran a tutoring center for many years, and often kids came into the iReady, and at that time I would have a 30 or 40 percent increase in enrollment, which is great for a business, but also often it did not give me the result that I necessarily received for that child. It doesn't really look at fluency. It doesn't look at the writing, and it doesn't look at a lot of other parts. So I want to make sure that we continue, and that is very important, that we, if we're going to test students, that we're very intentional, and I don't want a child to be three weeks into school and in their fourth or fifth test. So I, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Member Hahn? Thank you, Member Combs. Um, what percentage of instructional time is spent testing in kindergarten? I'll toss this over to, I know we were about 0.28% off the top, but Deidre, Deidre uh, Welch is our Executive Director for Assessment Accountability. Deidre, do you have those numbers in front of you, please? Yes. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, in kindergarten, uh, let's see, the total instructional time spent testing is 0.28%. And in second grade? 
In second grade, the total instructional time spent testing for this school year is 0.5%. So less than 1%. Correct. And what about in fifth grade? In fifth grade, the total instructional time spent testing is 2.09%. And in, um, and then once we hit high school, we start seeing that start to creep up a little bit, uh, or actually middle school, sorry. And really in ninth grade is where we hit the peak and that is what percentage of instructional time? In ninth grade, the total instructional time spent testing is 4.22%. Of instructional time? Yes. Okay, and what's the state average typically for any of those grades? Do we know that? Uh, we don't know that. That information okay. is not provided to us uh, as far as this document is concerned. It's district by district, and everybody is supposed to uh, keep under the 5%. Keep under the 5%. And we are, uh, you know, ninth grade is the highest at 4%. But most of our early childhood classrooms are, are less than 1%. Actually, um, whoops, they, they all are less than 1%. That is correct. Yeah, okay, thank you. I just wanted that to be on the record just so people are clear what type of numbers we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Member Hahn. And as you went through those numbers, um, that did not include iReady or Math Monthlies and other, um, evalu other evaluations that we use that aren't formal evaluations from the DOT. That percentage did not include iReady. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Member Vaughn? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I also asked for the percentages, and I was relieved when it sounded lower, but then I asked for the actual hours and what that equates to. Um, so what are the hours that, how many hours are kindergartners sitting for testing? I know it's 1% because we're doing it the whole of curriculum, but what are the number of hours? Uh, the way we need to report this to the Department of Education for this form is in minutes. Okay. So, it, so if it's all right with you, I'll do that. Sure. I can do the math. Um, in kindergarten, the, let's see, sorry, the total approximate uh, testing time in minutes is about 120 minutes. Okay. And I say approximate because some of the assessments, uh, students can have more time or less. And so I know we drastically jump up at third grade. That's our benchmark when we're talking about re retention and whatnot. So when we're looking at a typical third grader, how many minutes are they sitting for per year for our testing? So the approximate total testing time in minutes for a third grader is 705. 705 minutes. Yes. Okay. Um, and then when we got up to the, the largest one that was ninth grade, mm -hmm. I know we're talking about percentage. How many minutes is that? Uh, the percentage for the approximate total testing time in minutes is 2,280. But please uh, understand this includes all testing that's required uh, by the state and the district. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. And one last comment, the high school does not include the AP, SAT, ACT, PSA testing. It doesn't, is not included in those numbers, is that correct? Uh, that's correct because that's not required. Okay, I just I just wanted to clarify because when we talk about iReady and other tests, I think it's just you know it's misleading because there are other tests that students are so it's a lot more than two hours when you look at you know iReady's three times a year right it's a three times if they take it it's not mandatory but I just wanted to clarify there are tests that are not mandatory but there are many students who are being tested upon that is that correct? Uh, yes, there are many tests that are not mandatory, including classroom tests, uh, school tests that are not included on the required calendar. Yeah, and the APT, a APs, ACT, and all that, SAT. Okay, thank you so much. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 
103, purchase of seven mindsets, online portal licensed consulting, coaching, and customized district and site-based professional development from Seven Mindsets Academy, LLC. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, with the Seven Mindsets, this is our third year of implementing the Seven Mindsets curriculum. It is funded out of our mental health assistance uh, allocation. Uh, the Seven Mindsets Purchase Agreement supports the state's plan to build resiliency in our students and includes support for over 50 elementary, middle, and high school. I want to be clear that the Seven Mindsets is aligned to the new Florida State standards that support building resiliency, and the Seven Mindsets ally aligns with Florida rule required instructional planning and reporting uh, section and resiliency education. Thank you. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-103. I have a motion by Member Vaughn. I have a second by Member Washington. Member Gray and Member Rendon pulled this item. Member Gray? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, there, there has been talk, and, and uh, respectfully so, about the value uh, of class time. And um, we have teachers here on the board uh, and parents. The, there's the number one critical uh, priority for every teacher is the instructional time. Every five minutes that goes by that we have interruptions, distractions, um, subtracts from the quality of instruction. However, there's also another, um, another factor in having quality instructional time is, and that is the student's readiness to learn. So the mental um, capacity of a child, if there is trauma, uh, such as domestic violence, um, if there is hunger, such as food insecurity, if there is ACE, that means um, adverse childhood conditions, if there is a child that might be late for school, there's all types of avenues which make the child, um, let's just say not fully uh, able to receive information um, and we're talking high-level skills as well and STEM and STEAM where your left brain your analytical um, skill set is very it's in high demand that you have a student that is paying attention the social emotional <clears throat> behavioral learning addresses getting that student or students in plural ready to learn um, we have uh, I mean, I'm making a big deal out of the quality of instructional time because our teachers make a big deal of that. And the reason that Seven Mindsets or P uh, PBIS, uh, Positive Behavior Incentive Programs, or the Leadership in Me, we have those type of leadership resiliency programs. If practiced with 100% fidelity, or let's just say 90% fidelity, in other words, staff and students, the school changes its culture. Um, uh, in, indelibly, I have seen uh, at LATO, um, PBIS, the behaviors, teaching them positive behavior reactions to stress and to student uh, dissonance, such as uh, fighting, uh, there's a lot of the um, de-escalating from learning PBIS and practicing those um, incentive uh, supports and giving rewards to students who absolutely show that they have the ability to de-escalate their own temperament, but others as well. I've seen it at Chamberlain. Oh, my goodness. I've seen it throughout the uh, throughout our district. And in 2016, Ms. Uh, McRae, she remembers it very well, we started the PBIS from the University of South Florida, and now we're going to go full steam ahead again. But the other embedded practice, and I think this is more relevant, we talk about vocational career. Uh, it, it seems to be one of the most popular subjects, and, and for good reason. I. Um, I am reminded that Yvonne Fry, who has done a marvelous job with embedding, uh, working with collaboration with our English ELA teachers with soft skills. In other words, teaching the teach, uh, having the teachers absolutely embed with their instruction the importance of communication to employers. So when we say that mindsets are changing the culture, uh, building resiliency, as uh, Superintendent Ayers has uh, suggested, which is on the standards, by the way, 
we are developing what is called life skills for our kids. That means uh, seven mindsets includes accountability, includes goal setting, it includes resilience, it includes having a goal, and I, I know I just said goal setting, but having a goal, a reason to go to school, to get the best education, to finish school, to go to vocational and or college. That is critical. And last, uh, and this just came um, to all the board members uh, in the email, the, am I out of time? I got 30 seconds, this is real quick. Uh, the National Center on Safe Supportive Learning Environments invite, invited all of us, this is a National Department of Education, Office of Elementary and Secondary Education in the United States, has sh shown this throughout the uh, United States to school board members to come to this webinar, Strategies for School and District Leaders to Support Students' Social, Emotional, Behavioral, and Academic Well-Being. This is nationwide. It's going throughout the nation. So I, I am uh, definitely going to say yes to Seven Mindsets. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Rendon. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, we look at a lot of different things, and one of the things that I have to take into consideration is many times our teachers say we have too much. We're asked to do too much. We're asked to be too much in a classroom. We have too many things to do to get done in a school year. We've got to accomplish too much. So one of the things I want to make sure that we're always looking at is we're looking at what are we asking our teachers to do, what is the cost of what we're asking the teachers to do, and what is the return on our investment. Obviously, a student is the most important part of our investment. If we are spending dollars, we want to make sure that that student has a return on their investment. I do want to thank all of the staff for providing me all of the data. Because if we are looking at the seven mindsets and the ultimate goal of the seven mindsets, we should be looking over the course of the last three years of the implementation, we should be able to see a consistent or at least a trend in increase, uh, reducing behaviors, increase our academic scores, and increasing a positive return from our surveys from our students. Unfortunately, I didn't see that as a consistency in our data over the course of the last three years. The data that we have doesn't always show a significant decrease in our behaviors. It doesn't show an increase in our um, academics for the schools that have been participating any more than it does for any other school. Um, a school that was not in the seven mindsets are showing some of the same gains, which tells me it may be based upon what our teachers are doing and what our other district staff are doing to provide the support to the teachers to increase their academic you know, performances. Also, when it came to behaviors, the behaviors across the board in our district increased. And so the schools that were having seven mindsets for the last three years, none of the behaviors decreased at all. In fact, many of them increased. Unfortunately, that's what I have to look at, the basic data for what we're doing. And if we're spending money like $600,000, I have to look at every single dollar because every single dollar counts. We have to recognize the fact that where are we putting our money? Maybe this isn't the exact program that's going to make the difference. And unfortunately, the data is not showing, even when we look at our panorama data, the average data is not showing that the students themselves feel a difference over the course of the last three years. Um, and so because of that, I want to look exactly at the data and exactly what we're doing, not because something feels good or it looks good on paper, but exactly what is the change that's happening. And our most important thing is student behavior, student outcomes and achievement, and again, students' mental health and how they feel. And the data doesn't consistently show that seven mindsets itself is making a difference because the data doesn't show that. So thank you guys so much for providing me all that information. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Vaughn. Thank you. Uh, well, first I want to say that the only reason I'm really familiar with Panorama, because unfortunately we weren't using it when I was in the classroom, is because I've gone into so many schools when we've talked about um, restorative practices or things that have really transformed the school culture. What I've been told by administrators and educators time and time again, out of all the things that we've provided them with, is the seven mindsets 
repeatedly over and over again. And while I do think data is important, I think it's incredibly hard through one survey panorama, which isn't specifically tied to this program specifically, to gauge what a whole cultural and mind shift looks like. Um, so I, I kind of want to point out my personal experience because it is hard to gauge with just data on student performance, like what's being effective and what isn't when we have a million different things that we're kind of throwing at our students. So for me, going into schools and firsthand having the people who are implementing this talk about what a revolutionary change this has provided with them, their interactions with their students, their students' self-confidence, inner classroom relationships, um, self, I mean, again, just resiliency which we talk about all of the things that are so important to building that foundation for a student to be open to learning the material that they need to but I did want to ask some questions because we've got some emails about it and I, I would like clarity on that for as we move forward um, I don't really see how you would opt out of this because it's more a, a mindset that our educators learn and then and give to our students but is there an option to opt out of this if parents need to because there's really not much to opt out of it's more like a philosophy from our educators but is there an out, opt out option no, no opt out <laughs> okay <laughs> um also are we concerned with any student data being shared with this as far as i know there's not a login with an id or any student information where we could track or data would be shared is that a concern that we have with this no so the seven mindsets does not gather data on indi individual students uh, the data that is gathered uh, includes number of lessons completed by educator number of educators accessing the portal and sites using the seven mindsets portable so there's no individual student data member bond that is associated with, with seven mindset. Okay, I appreciate that. And um, we've had a speaker and some emails that referenced a, a decline in proficiency, and I know that we referenced Chicago school system, which has its own challenges and I don't think can be compared to Hillsborough County. Are there any data points that we've seen in anywhere in schools in actual Florida or Hillsborough County that has implemented this where they've seen a direct correlation between proficiency late rates and the implication or use of this program? I'll, I'll answer. I mean, I, th I think that as you look at um, with, with this, there's really no um, data as we look at um, this being our benchmark year for our standards, so there's nothing really for us to compare to. That's why me moving forward with this third year, we'll have that performance data to be able to look back at this prior year. But this was a benchmarking year for us this past year, so there's nothing to really to, to gauge from that. Okay, and then I know that there's concerns and confusion about the term social emotional learning and then new standards that we have that go around resiliency and character does this meet the, the new standards that have been laid out when we talk about character building, resiliency? Does this program provide the fundamentals for that standard? Yes. So um, as I kind of mentioned in, in the comments earlier, the seven mind sense is aligned to the new state, uh, Florida state standards on building resiliency, and it also aligns with Florida rule required instruction planning and reporting section for resiliency education. So yes, ma'am. Okay, um, so just my personal opinion, which I know you're all dying to hear, is um, I, I don't understand why there is an attack on social emotional learning. Um, you know, parents have every right to teach any morals at home that they want to, fundamentals, anything that they feel is important. But as our student go into the classrooms, they're there are general expectations, right? When we talk about school-wide pledges, when we talk about classroom rules, those are all based on a shared understanding of what's, you know, acceptable behavior, what's being kind and respectful to both our teachers and our fellow classmates. And it's important that we're setting those expectations and making sure that's clear and building that into the culture. When we talk about culture and climate and how we're excited we are to have you leading the charge, that all comes down to expectations of how we treat each other in our classrooms and our interactions and, you know, again, building confidence and um, celebrating things that make us um, who we are or things that make us good at something. So to me, again, I, I'm really confused about why this is even an, an issue. I don't think that in any way this violates parental rights. I'm not concerned that my son's going to go and, and learn something that's going to contradict what I teach him at home. And there are students who don't have the benefit of having role models due to societal issues or familial issues. You know, there are students who are in our foster care that aren't exposed to necessarily these concepts that build these fundamental qualities. And for me, not wanting to have every kid in our classroom have an opportunity to learn these life skills that are so important in building 
what the standard says, character development, resiliency. Um, I want every student to have access to that information. So I'm really excited about this issue. I'm surprised there was any resistance to it, and I, I can't wait to vote for it. So thank you again. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Perez. Thank you, Madam Chair. So let me provide some sobering statistics, and then I'll get into um, what I need to say. So, you know, services for mental, emotional, and behavioral well-being for, for children are limited. Um, our children are growing in a very different society, very different circumstances today. 20% of our children have mental health issues, 20%. And I'll get into those numbers in a moment. Um, personal responsibility, learning how to communicate with each other, healthy emotions, managing emotions, and effective relationships is what they learn. I had the opportunity of speaking with three students that their parents allowed me to speak, and this is what they said to me. Miss, I love to learn math and English, but I love to learn to speak with my classmates also. Lady, it's important to make friends in school, and this helps me learn. And I learn to have good friends. And the last one, I learn how to use my words to stay out of trouble. Before I didn't have words. Now I have words, and I don't get into trouble anymore. We need to provide our children with total supports, not just reading and math. Right now, in society today, we find children presenting with depression. Two to three percent of our children ages six to 12. Many have serious depression. 3.2 percent of our children aged three to 17 have been diagnosed with depression. That is 3.1 million. Did you hear that number? Million young people between the ages of 12 and 17 have experienced at least one major depressive episode. 20% of those are girls and 6.8% of those are boys. And depression along with anxiety. So if they don't understand what is happening with them and they don't have the words to describe that, they could never communicate. I don't care how much reading, math, science we put in front of these children, they won't have the words to tell us how they're feeling and be able to be successful. We won't be able to prepare them for life because they will be stagnant where they are. So for me, this is important. The piece that we continue to put in front of our children in order to prevent them from having these issues increase over time. So for this board member, access to supports for our children can make a difference for them today and for the rest of their lives. I'm supporting this, thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm supporting it. And one of the reasons why I'm just coming out and say I support it. Have you, ever, have you all been to She High Elementary School? What a great program they have there. They have turned around, they have turned around the culture of that school. And Delia has done a hell of a job. I mean, a great job with turning that around. Because they work on that summer mindset. And I, I go by it, I love it. I love it. The kids are well behaved. But you know, you're going to get culture before you get learning. Because without culture, there is no learning. Being a former principal at the school, we, I had to turn around. I had to change the culture first, and then the learning came in. And most of the time, when you go into a school and and to, to have a turnaround, it takes a period of time. And if you look at the data parts of it, three years, it takes a, a long time. So I tell you, I am I'm ecstatic about the summer mindset because I love it. Because Delia has set a whole example over at she High. If you have not just go by she High and see. Madam Chair, that's all I have to say. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Hahn? Thank you, Member Perez. Thank you, 
Member Combs, I appreciate all my uh, board members' comments. Uh, I agree with many of them. Um, you know, uh, one of our school board members mentioned some other programs like Leader in Me, which is in some of our schools, not all of our schools, that also embeds lessons and mindset um, mindset around resiliency and character. And you know, I've seen the impact of that firsthand, which is wonderful. Um, and it's a shame um, every school doesn't have that program, but um, I won't get to go down that path, Mr. Porter. Um, but um, you know, so res teaching kids resiliency um, and character is a very important part of their well-being. And it's even something that we taught at USF in our teacher prep program. And we found that, you know, we really embedded it in just about every course we taught. And when we looked at the data of our students who went into the teaching field, those who had coursework in resiliency stayed in the profession longer because when things got rough, they knew how to support themselves to get through it through different um, strategies. So it's very important. Um, and it doesn't happen intrinsically for everybody. Some people have to be taught the res that re to be resilient and how to be resilient. Um, you know, um, just to respond to why all the commotion about SEL, well, I'm, I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to give my opinion on that. Um, you know, originally the SEL curriculum, oh, it, well, it, it always was very focused on the very things we talk about today that are important around. Um, preparing kids with uh, life skills and character and resiliency. But at some point in time, it, it was hijacked by some organizations that started to embed more cultural, political, highly politicized agendas. And that broke the trust of parents. And so, yeah, they're very skeptical now. And they're, they're sensitive to, um, to, to that curriculum now. And it's going to take some time to build that trust back to show that, you know, this programs like, um, you know, Seven Mindsets or Frameworks or any other program that, that teaches kids about resiliency and character and life skills is doing exactly that and no, and not, no more than that. And um, staying within, you know, the, those conversations and um, the expectations of, of parents around those types of things. So I think, you know, parents are going, to, you know, they, they, like I said, I think that, you know, it, it, it's going to take some time to build that trust back with parents. Um, you know, I was very, um, I asked a lot of questions, even had one last meeting today with staff leading up to this because I wanted to be very sure that um, you know, we were aligning with state standards, that we were, um, you know, aligning with state statute in, in this curriculum. And I was um, reassured on a number of occasions and provided examples of how we were doing just that. As far as the data, um, look, I love data as much as the next gal, but uh, <laughs> I will say this, um, Panorama is not the purpose of that is to not evaluate the impact of seven mindsets. And so to say that um, seven mindsets is not effective because parent, par, uh, you know, we, we, the data from, from that shows that um, XYZ hasn't changed, well, it's not set up to test for resiliency and character. So there is no correlation between the panorama data and seven mindsets. Statistically speaking, research, you know, putting my research hat on. Um, if you want us to get data around seven mindsets, then that's something staff will have to work on to collect data on the impact of seven mindsets. But to take something that has no direct relationship with the curriculum or a supplemental curriculum and use that to say it's not impactful in our district over the last X is, you know, in my opinion, I'm not fair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Member Hahn. And um, I, I went back and uh, a couple weeks ago and I, I reread the book, Seven Mindsets, because we all received a copy. And it really reminded me personally of some things that I personally need to work on. And I think so many children are desensitized these days. And it's really important to teach resiliency, being kind, 
all of those skills, th those are seven steps to be a more effective person. We have to remember EQ and IQ are also very important. It's not always someone's IQ. The most intelligent person is not usually the most successful person. I think EQ and understanding and, and being compassionate and being kind is a very, very important thing. I lie in a district where I do have a large number of students in a foster, we have foster home students, we have families that are coming in, living with individuals that maybe don't speak the same language and they're trying to adjust. And so I think a lot of the seven mindsets kind of reminds you of the kind of person that you need to be. Also, many of our teachers, someone came up and said, you know, that our teachers weren't trained. Many of our teachers are state required and they received that youth mental health first aid training. So our teachers have received training on that. Now, are they mental health specialists? No, but they have received training. So it's not as if our teachers are just handed a book and said, teach this. And so I absolutely support this. I read over this, keeping an open mind. Um, and I think any parent, if they read this book, I think they also would support it as well. Thank you. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes with six votes for yes and member rending voting no. Next up is 202 Soul Source 23088 SSD SKIV CEV Multimedia LLC purchase of digital curriculum. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. The CTE department is requesting to purchase digital curriculum that will be used in various middle and high school CTE programs in the following career clusters agriculture, food and natural resources, business management and administration, health science, and marketing, sales and service. We expect that over 6,000 students will be able to utilize the various digital curriculum from CEV Multimedia as a primary instructional resource in their CTE program. Thank you. Thank you. I need a motion a second to approve item C202. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Member Vaughn, you pull this item. I did, thank you. Um, one of the concerns that I've heard about our CTE programs, um, and there's not many because they're great, um, though, is that the instructional part is kind of lacking with direct instruction. And that some of the complaints I've heard from both the students and, and people who are involved in our CTE program is that then we do just kind of sit them on the computer for the general instruction part and that's kind of doing a disservice when our other traditional students are getting more of that direct instruction. Um, and so I know I had questions and concerns about you know, if we implement this, is what that's going to look like. And I did get the email outlining it, but I'm going to be honest, it didn't give me the confidence that this is really going to give our students who are in our CTE programs enough direct instruction on our core curriculum to really make sure they have the foundation that they need along with the skills that they're learning if they choose not to go on to higher academics and they, they decide to do trade schooling. So. Unfortunately, I'm not going to support this item, <laughs> um, but I do appreciate all the information that I've gotten it. And I just, again, as we advocate to grow our CTE programs, I just want to make sure that we're also focusing on the foundation of our course instruction and our core curriculum and making sure that we're not just sitting kids on the computer to supplement that and then really putting the energy into only teaching them the trade. So I appreciate all the information. I wish it, you know, a moved me in a direction, but I still feel like I would prefer to have more direct implicit instruction coming from our, our, um, our educators in that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes with five votes for yes, and Member Vaughn and Member Perez voting no. Next, it, next is 705, increase in expenditure for invitation to bid 21013 DSTIV fuel. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. So 705 and 706 are really uh, together. We'll take each of them individually. 705 is our diesel fuel. 706 is our 87 octane. So first with 705 uh, to supplement repairs and services for Yellow Fleet, active Yellow Bus, and over 560 support vehicle vehicles. Red dye diesel is used in all our Yellow Buses and some of our support vehicles. Uh, due to in, due to the inflation in goods and supplies, the district has seen an increase about 15 to 30 percent that has affected our fuel purchase prices. There Therefore, an increased funds are needed to cover the fuel costs for the 24, 20, uh, 2024 school year. And again, this one is for diesel. 706 is our 87 octane. Thank, Thank you, you, Superintendent Harris. I need a motion, a second to approve item C705. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Member Gray, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a quick question. This is a financial question. Um, does this affect uh, this expenditure affect our fund balance? We're to, uh, and I'm putting both of them together, five and two. That's uh, a lot right. of money for the mill. We work closely with the business department. In fact, they're the ones that actually purchased this fuel. So when Ms. Johnson does the budget, it's part of what we roll, in, we roll into that. So increased expenditures are something that they, they accommodate for. I don't want to speak too much of to the fund balance. But yes, they budgeted this for the 23-24 school year. So what I'm hearing is that we budgeted um, for this rise of expenditure that has been. Did you bring that out uh, to the board members? Sorry, Ms. Gray. Any cost increase of non personnel or personnel impacts our fund balance overall. It's a reduction to our overall fund balance. Okay, let me just be clear. I'm talking about the fuel cost. Not so, yes, it's so non personnel costs. Yes, it's fuel or any electric energy costs impacts our fund balance. And if I can jump in, I mean, Mr. Fark, this is just our cost of doing business, right? I mean, so we know, I mean, obviously we've all felt the, the prices of gasoline. We also experienced that with items 705 and 706 with the 15 to 30 percent increase in cost, correct? And, and as Ms. Johnson said, anything that comes out of part one affects our, our fund balance. But we, it is something that we actually, Ms. Johnson's team actually saves us money as opposed to if we bought fuel from the pump. It's about a sixty to seventy thousand dollar annual savings that they get by us buying the fuel directly from the distributor. Uh, but yes, to your point, it is come out of the general fund. So in theory, if there's an increased cost, it does affect the fund balance. Okay, um, I'm just keeping track of finances. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Farkas and uh, Ms. Romanier Johnson. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Vaughn. Thank you. I was going to pull this item, but I decided not to because I was being kind to my fellow board members. But since it's been pulled, I just want to say that I appreciate the fact that we're highlighting that costs go up every single year. And just in fuel alone, we're looking at $2.5 million in um, extra expenditures because of the price of fuel. So, you know, we have a lot of conversation about living within our means and there's been you know public conversation coming about our per pupil rate and how much we get and as we lobby i just i think it's important thank you member gray for pointing out like how much everything is rising whether it's food or gas or what that looks like and 2.5 million here or 3.5 million there <clears throat> that all can add up for a step for our employees so thanks for pulling this item um and i just want to point that out thank you thank you member vaughn member hahn Member Combs, this is um, this has a uh, four-year renewal. Is that correct? Did I read that? This contract has a four-year renewal, Mr. Farkas. Yes, sorry, it's it's done through a business. I want to make sure I was looking at the same thing. But yes, they we budget it and look at the at the prices that we buy. But it's a four-year agreement that we originally signed. Correct. Does it lock in this price over four years? No, we every year we negotiate it. It's just, is this a blind bid? No, I don't believe it is. It was an ITB that originally went out. So can you? So how did how did that work? Did they just? So it wasn't that they had to submit cost and we got the lowest cost. What were the attributes that they won the bid? So the original was based on cost, and there's an amount they can go they can go up each year on that part of it too. But the original was an invitation to bid with a cost being the predominant factor of why we chose Colonial. Okay, so th this five million was the lowest cost. Correct. Okay, so um, I guess you know I get when I see automatic renewals, that's when I get a little uncomfortable. 
<laughs> um, especially, you know, when you're dealing with money, um, because you're not going, you're not putting it out back on the street every year to, to get the best price. So why, why lock them into four years? That's a long time. It'll never come back to, to the board during that time. So why, why do we, you know, why do we lock them in for four years? I understand in certain circumstances we do that because we guarantee that price over two or three years. But in this case, and I'm sorry I didn't ask you this before, but as I'm looking at this, these questions are now coming to my mind. No, and as I've told the board, I'm a fan of putting it back out. I mean, it's unfortunately, it's a work of the procurement department, but it's it, I 100% think we can put that back out on a regular basis. This just went out in 21, 22, so this is just the first one, uh, renewal. But, yes, I, I completely think that we should send that back out each year to do it. I can't think of a compelling reason to do that. Traditionally, and I don't mean to speak, you know, not, not knowing too much about it, but traditionally it's done from the business department because they've been so good at purchasing the fuel, so I don't want to – you know, say why that didn't didn't happen or why it's a good reason to do it. But yeah. I agree with you. Anytime we're putting something out, we should put it out for the most competitive market price out there. Yeah, that's that's the only thing that really concerned me. And, you know, it is unfortunate. We're all paying an enormous amount of money over the last three years for gas when there's other uh, strategies to bring that cost down and, you know, uh, at the federal level. And now we're all paying for it. And we can see how much it's gone up over the last three years. And, you know, it's just really, um, it, yes, it is hurting our general fund. Mm -hmm. But those are coming from the federal. I mean, you know, that's coming from the White House, not not the State House. Thank you. If I could follow back up on that, Dr. Hunter, I apologize. I'm looking a little bit deeper into it. So the original cost for the four companies that bid on it was a markup on the gas price that we have. So they pay a markup on the standard price that everyone pays. So the quantity we knew – but the cost of the markup per gallon on the on the industry standard, Colonial Oil was cheaper than the other ones, 0 0.1024, where the other ones were higher. So that's why we stayed with them. So even if we went with the other three, their markup was the lowest of those four companies. Yeah, look, it it is what it is. I mean, gas is, you know, every day you go to the tank and it's more and more expensive to even fill up your car, let alone a fleet of school buses. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Farkas. And Dr. Hanna, I'd just like to add to that. What happens is they do a markup based on their rates they're charging us to go out and search for lower cost gas fuel that we purchase. And what my team does, we, we lock in at the lower rates. When the rates are real low, we try to lock in for a long term period. So sometimes we get our gas for the whole year at a lower rate, but most of the time they only allow us to lock in for six months. And because so sometimes we might lock in at six months and the gas drop lower. So I, I, we have to just work with the market. But we are working with them to always get us, make sure that any cost is lower for the district overall. Yeah, anytime I see that three, four year renewal, I just get a little nervous. That's but. the percentage of the markups that goes to them for searching for low rates for the district. Yeah, okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Member Hahn, Member Press. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we know that the, there was um, the governor vetoed $354 million for our fuel. But let me ask a question. I know we spoke last week about electric buses. I mean, the week before, the board meeting before. Um, what about propane, our propane buses? So we currently have 100 propane buses that run out of the West Tampa location. There's one where the length of the fuel that we can use on propane, but we have that. We have a propane fueling station that we use over by Lois Avenue. What is the cost of propane as opposed to this fuel? I don't have it in front of me. I'd have to get that information for you. Mr. Is it cheaper? Yes, it is cheaper. Okay, so let me ask. When will we get more propane buses? Are you planning on purchasing more? The industry has changed, so electric is one that is a little bit cheaper on the loft, lifetime cost analysis. Electric's uh, more expensive up front, but over the cost of the vehicle when you're doing charging, the electricity is less expensive than the propane, which you have to redo. Mm -hmm. There's also a cost for the propane buses for repair that's much much more expensive than what the electric are and what the diesel are. So mm -hmm. when you do a life, lifetime cost analysis, which we've done in that, propane versus compressed national gas versus electric. Electric for the lifetime cost is, is, is cheaper. So if you can do the upfront cost for electric, that's the way to go. Um, at the time, propane was cheaper, which we bought four and a half years ago, five years ago. Propane was the best uh, vehicle for us when we're looking at trying to be sustainable and be have a li little bit less of a carbon footprint with all those 900 buses on the road. Are, are, and they're still on the road? Yes, ma'am. Okay. How much does it, can you give us a price on how much it is to fill those 
900? I can't, but I don't have it in front of me no. right now. I can okay. propane information for you. Can you provide that to us, please? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Member Press. And I guess we're on the same wavelength because I, I had pulled that item and I had spoken to you, Mr. Farkas, about that. And thank you so much. And that was kind of my concern, too, on the cost of the fuel and just not, we're not getting additional funding, but everything's more expensive. But just the other day on the uh, Business Observer, um, they looked at the affordability of living in cities in Florida, and based on egg, bread, fuel cost, housing, internet, and salaries, the most expensive state to a city to live in in Florida right now is Tampa's number one, and believe it or not, Sarasota's number two. Three is Clearwater, and four is St. Pete. So I just want to remind everyone that you know, we, we are really property poor. We're not, we're getting very low funding and we are one of the most, we are the most expensive city to live in based on, on the affordability and what we're receiving as far as salaries. Thank you. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Okay, next up is the increase in expenditure for invitation to bid 21013 DSTIV fuel. Superintendent Ayers, you already highlighted this item. Yeah, this is the same oh, as yes. 705. So, um, board members, I need a motion. Uh, I need a motion a second to approve item C705. I have a motion by Member Vaughn. Oh, 706, I'm sorry. Okay, 706, yes. Um, thank you. Mr. Porter, I have a motion by Member Vaughn. I have a second by Member Washington. Member Gray, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? No, Madam Chair. They're answered. Thank you. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. Oh, oh. I just want to fix something on the record. I said um, $354 million, but it was $377 million. All right. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. We moved too fast on that one. <laughs> okay. 714, increase in expenditures for piggyback 2104 PGB BJH of the agreement between multiple vendors and Region 4 ESC Omnia Partners Public Sector Agreement R2004001 HVAC Equipment Installation Service and Related Products. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, approval of this agreement is requested to repair and or replace HVAC units district-wide. By using this agreement, the district will prolong HVAC units by having a vendor to maintain, repair, or replace as needed. There are currently seven district sites in need of repair and or replacement of major HVAC units. Thank you. I need a motion a second to approve item C714. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member... Member Hahn, thank you. Member Vaughn and I pulled this item. Member Vaughn, you can begin. Thank you. Um, Mr. Farkas, so I just want to reiterate my understanding of this item. This is not for new air conditionings. This is for the maintenance and repair of the existing air conditionings, correct? It is not for large construction, but if we got a new chiller, for instance, really? it could be in that part of it too, but it's not the whole HVAC replacements we do through construction. That's correct. Okay. Um, so school started. Some of the concerns that I had are air conditionings. Um, I appreciate how responsive you've been to the request, and I appreciate the um, kind of public service thing that we put on the website with you explaining the tax referendum and how air conditioning works. I think that's really important because a lot of the frustration that I personally see are people don't understand why we're, you know, so many years into to, uh, pledging to fix our air conditionings, and we still have so many air conditionings, I mean, classrooms that are struggling with air conditionings, especially in the Florida heat. Um, so I noticed there are nine locations on this agenda item, but it says not limited to. So can you help me understand how we're breaking up this funding with these nine locations specifically, and then what that leaves for additional sites or how we're allocating this money? 
Yes, it's a great question. So the nine sites that are there with Booker T. Washington and Wilson and ISC and Orange Grove, um, those are where we're doing actual chiller replacement. So we'll do like a huge, large chiller. It's between one hundred to three hundred thousand um, dollars. Any large items, that's why those seven are listed. That is uh, that was probably less than you know a million, million and a half dollars. The rest of it goes to the everyday repair. So when you call and say, "Hey, Schwartz coughs down. We need to go replace a, a motor or something like that," that comes out of that nine million dollars. So that is where all the rest of the of the money after those seven sites goes to that. It'll be millions of dollars to replace sites. So it, it goes everywhere that's needed. And so when we're looking at such a massive jump, I mean, you know, almost $8 million from the last time that we approved this, what are you attributing that massive jump to? That's a great question. Um, instead of doing everything in large projects, we found sites, Tampa Bay Tech, for instance, this in the last week, where we don't need to do a whole replacement, the chiller is down or the cooling tower is down, something like that that's a large item. Uh, so instead of either doing minimal repair or large repair, we found this middle ground repair where it's all the air handler unit, so what blows inside the inside the classroom is fine. It's the big chiller outside that cools the water. That's what we need to do. So the big jump is we found that replacing big parts of air conditioning systems get us to repair quicker than waiting until we do the entire replacement at four or five, six million dollars. This is um, to make it your outside unit at your house. We're replacing that. We're not replacing everything on the inside, all the duct work and all that stuff too. This item allows us to do some bigger repairs without doing an entire HVAC replacement. We found this to be very, very successful. And I know that teachers, when a AC doesn't work in your classroom, it's very upsetting. I would be the same way. But when we had whole sites that are down and we're able to fix a chiller and replace the chiller, it can actually fix the entire site. So it makes a big difference. So we found this approach has made a much bigger difference with the number of maintenance requests we've had, the number of down sites we've had, total sites down this year is much less than it's been a year's past. Again, no number is acceptable, but it's much lower number of sites, whole sites that are down because of items like this. And do you think this offers a cooling option more quickly because you're starting to chill as opposed to having to wait for the part or the repair? A hundred percent. Where we can get it a new system where it's a three or four week wait for a part and repair. So we try to make sure we salvage that system and don't throw away the old system, which is a, one of the challenges we face. But this is much quicker and a much quicker response with the, the Daikin and some of the ones that you see in front of you, the JCIs, that we can fix those sites immediately, um, 24 to 48 hours. So can I ask you, just because I've had a lot of these questions aimed at me specifically, if there is a report that air conditioning is not working, what should be the average turnaround time and how long should an, a classroom be with hot so the classrooms? Never is the, is the real answer of that, if I was that teacher. But each school is a little bit different. So we say there's got to be a 24-hour turnaround time before we're out there to assess what's going on. So within the day, we're going to go out there and say, hey, can it be fixed? A lot of our, because there's a lot of technology involved with it, it's a reset a lot of times. where We can start cooling right away. There's, that happens more often probably than, than, than you'd think. That being said, if it's going to be more than one day, Temporary cooling needs to be placed or we need to move the classrooms around. Some principals are, are new principals. We've had to coach them a little bit, not only in that negative way, um, to say, hey, let's put them in the media center until we can get that fixed. Or let's put them, let's combine some classes to make that happen. But we have some large schools where that's not possible. Um, when that happens, we do spot coolers or air-cooled, water-cooled spot coolers. That actually tries to help it, but it's, it's not the same thing. It's not 76 degrees when you have a spot cooler in there. It's 77, 78 degrees, um, which... While it's not nothing, it's still not where you want it to be in that part of it, too. So 24 hours to go check out the problem, 48 hours without air is when we make sure that we have a, some kind of spot cooler that's in there. And that's for larger things. There may be a classroom where we've got to wait for a part. Um, well, we can't fix that, so we got to have them move in that part, too. So to answer your question, 48 hours for any large outages. Thank you. And my one last question, I think I have time, <laughs> Woo. Um, is are you confident that if we spend this extra $8 million that we're going to have less issues with our air conditioning as we head into the year so yes but we're you spent 88 million dollars you spent 80 million dollars on construction projects in addition to this eight million dollars and we could spend another 80 to get to where we need to go is the short answer to that question so yes this will make us better but it's not going to make us 100 percent and like i use the reference in the in the press conference it's a it's equivalent to over 14,000 homes so when you leave your neighborhood if you live in a large neighborhood you can usually see an ac repair truck somewhere on your street when you're when you're going through the neighborhood it's the same thing here it's never going to be perfect but 100 percent, i could say unequivocally this will help us okay thank you thank you member ron and and i also had a question you you asked most of the questions that i had what about i hear often that you turn off the air at night you keep it on can you clarify that because often teachers ask about that it is the exact same thing. Many of us, I don't want to put my home needs in, on yours, but 
if your set point at home is 76 and you leave to go to work, you set it up to 78 or 79 degrees, the AC is not on. It doesn't cycle as often as it does. So we do the same thing. We raise that up um, every night. We never turn them off. Uh, that, that doesn't happen that way. Um, if it's going off, that means there's a problem, and that happens from time to time. But no, they don't. We raise the set point. We raise that temperature. We do not turn them off. And I will say, I mean, obviously there's been issues. We have over 250 schools, but I hear all around districts who have major, major issues. And with the sales tax referendum, I mean, it has, I can't imagine if we didn't have that, what our schools would look like. Well, and we've, I'm glad you brought that up because there have been, and I don't want to pick on other schools. I did call COO from a local district and thanked her uh, for causing more problems than we had. But no, seriously, we have, we do have that before the sales tax referendum. We had between five and ten million dollars to do AC projects. This year, we're doing almost a hundred million dollars. If we were at five or ten million dollars, we were before the sales tax referendum. I wouldn't be sitting here. I promise, and probably Van wouldn't either. Mr. Harris wouldn't be either. We would not have jobs because you guys would be getting hammered ten times worse than you have right now. We have spent four hundred million dollars on AC in the last five years. If we were spending five million dollars a year, the problems would be exponentially worse than what they are right now. So we. Uh, we are very lucky and very blessed that our, our taxpayers had faith in us to do that. That's why we try to be very transparent about where that money's going to local businesses to fix AC. But the sales tax referendum in our community invested in it. If we did not have that, I can promise you we would be in the same situation some of our surrounding districts are where there's 50 schools without AC or on the Today Show. You know, 30 schools without AC, which is what some of our surrounding districts, districts have. So um, our team works very hard to make sure we're doing that. But we have to thank the community for having faith in us to put that money in the sales tax. Yeah, and we hope people will come out to the community so to they to, to attend the meeting so they can see and they can basically get an update on all of that. One last thing, and I know I talked to you about this last year, and I know I'm talking to you about this again. Um, Volusia County, you know, has that amazing HVAC CTE program. I'd love to get you know a dozen or more students, you know, who are in high school. Can we start? walking through and creating a program like that, a CTE, an HVAC program internally so we have more technicians to support our schools who are students. So we do. Um, yeah. Brooks and I have worked very hard to have some of that. Adults usually work a little bit closer, but I'll be honest with you because um, we're in a not, – nobody's listening. It's not a public forum. Um, when they go through our AC uh, setting and go to, the, to our school and we train them for that, um, what we pay to work to do our AC compared to what other companies, it's Florida – they can't find enough technicians to do it. I mean, they are paying literally three and four times more than we are uh, out in the open market to do that. That's our biggest challenge. Um, they do work for us. We have people that are here. But if you look at most of our AC techs, they've been around for 20 or 25 years, have stayed with us. We're very lucky. There is not a lot of young air conditioning technicians that work for Hillsborough County Public Schools. So we definitely need to look at what that looks like. We have the program. Yes. We train with us. They go on the job with our guys and, and do that. But unfortunately, we are it's true in other places, but the, what they pay for starting salary and what we pay is miles apart. And, and how does that Volusia County program work that keeps those students a little bit more internally? I just I just wanted to see how that works. So they do an apprentice program. Yes, that's, that's what I was saying. Can, can we do too. something similar to that? Can we, we look into that? We, we do, but it's not. It's usually the apprenticeship program where the company that works for us, like right. some of our 13 vendors that work on our stuff, actually they take those apprentices to work on the contract with the school district. So, yes, we definitely can do that. Um, like, we definitely push them that. Because when I spoke to a school board member it, in Volusia County, they seem to be able to retain those students a little bit more than we've been able to. So I was just wondering why that is. And I'll, and I'll look at that and get you answered. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, member Hahn? Thank you, Member Holmes. Um, uh, just uh, piggybacks in general. Next time we have an agenda item like this, could you attach the agreement? Yes. Thank you. Board members, we may have to pause this for public comment. So um, I will go ahead and, and pause this. Or okay, would you? Can we can okay? We can continue. I just at six o'clock, um, Member Perez. I just didn't know how how robust this co uh, this conversation was going to be. Um, I just want to ask, how many different construction managers are working on these HVAC jobs? So, last year we had about twenty three different construction managers that we work with, and twenty three different design professionals. Twenty three. Okay. How many are OSD vendors? So. Almost every single large project, with the exception of one, has an OSD partner that works with them on that part. 80% went to local and minority businesses out of our sales tax referendum over the past three years. 
So every single large project that was awarded has an OSD vendor that's partnered with a large firm. Okay. Um, okay. So, and you were you mentioned it. It's eight million for parts as opposed to putting in a brand new system, correct? Yeah, a whole system. So we could do, and we parts, I don't want to give that misnomer, parts can be a whole chiller, which is a huge part of your of your air conditioning system. So, but yes, that's considered in part of this is, is a brand new chiller. But as opposed to doing an entire, the projects you see that we did at, at, at Tomlin or we did it at one of the schools of this past time where we do an entire HVAC replacement, this is for just the chiller or just the air handler, parts of the, big parts of that system, yes. And how much does normally a system cost? So at elementary school, we found between two and five million dollars. A middle school between five and eight, and a high school eight to twelve. That's very rough, but I mean that's kind of the the guide we go by. Um, a chiller can be one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand uh, dollars that would take out of that part too. So there will be numerous schools that drawn off this nine million dollars. Okay, so and that would be, would they come back to us if that nine million dollars is capped? Yes, if we hit the $9 million, we'll be back in front of you. We take uh, new items that are here um, every year. You see AC um, vendors every single year, so you'll see this again. Um, but if we don't get to $9 million, obviously it'll stay in capital funds. If we go over it, we'll be back in front of you asking for an extension on that part of it too. All right, thank you. Thank you, Member Press. Member Gray? Yeah, this is a good opportunity to thank the Oversight Committee tremendously uh, because uh, the delayed ma maintenance that um, – that we had in, uh, I think it was 2018 that we passed that referendum. Um, Chris, uh, Mr. Farkas, can you um, give us an estimate? How many schools did we take care of in terms of the HVAC um, with our referendum monies? So the goal was to have 203 at the end of 10 years. That's what our, our plan was. We've done just under 100 and we're halfway there. So we're pretty much on, on track for what we did. We had the COVID year, we went down probably about five or six less than we thought. So we're about halfway there. We're almost at 100 schools we've done HVAC replacements on. And we have about five more years to our referendum? Yes, ma'am. And another 100 schools will work through those next five years. Yeah. Will we get that taken care of before? <laughs> yes, before. I hope so, uh, depending on how much the costs increase for construction. But yes, ma'am, that's the plan right now is to make sure we get through, the, through those next five Five years. Okay, I think you're doing a wonderful job, and the, the 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 seriousness of having a lack of labor force is probably just equally as serious as the monetary uh, value of getting it fixed. So, you know, that's a it, that's what we're looking at. Two things, but anyway, Mr. Farkas and your staff, uh, I want to thank you publicly for everything that you all are doing, securing AC and everything else to our infrastructure and the oversight committee. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Real, real quick, uh, Mr. Falkes, thank you because you guys have really been working hard. Uh, it's been a hot summer. It's been really a hot summer. So, you know, I know you're working hard. Well, but, uh, I appreciate you saying that, but Mr. Washington, as you guys know, just like we're in the back and we see the teachers that are going to speak to us, if there's one teacher that has a hot classroom, you still, your heart goes out to them because you know how hard it is right. to teach and you know that there's, if there's no AC in there. We're not comfortable until we get every single classroom there, so it's it's that uphill battle. But Ben Moore, his team, Kenny Otero, who works AC, are the ones that actually are front lines that take those calls every single day. Um, they're the ones that actually are the ones that get those calls when they're out that part of it, too. So I want to make sure we thank uh, Ben Moore, Kenny Otero, and his team at AC. Oh, yeah, that's your team. Yep. It's just like you have a football team. That's your team. Uh, quickly, um, do we can, can the schools override the, the central system? No. Uh, especially, oh. not with, especially not with our new system. There are some older schools that uh, were around back when we were uh, principals that are, we haven't right. upgraded. Some of those where they've, they've got that override. But no, because the reality is, is 76 degrees as a set point has got to be our industry standard. It's not, it causes problems when someone sets it down to it. There's called tests and balance when one room's real hot and one room's real cold next to it. So if you have two teachers next to each other that have extreme differences, it actually hurts the system. So no, it's the set point should be set at the district office. Um, there are a few schools, we won't say which ones, that still have a little bit of control, but yeah, that should be at the district office. I didn't mean to share our secrets, you know that. Excuse me. Thank you, um, Member Washington, Member Press. Um, Superintendent, can I request a rolling schedule for our AC repairs by site um, and for replacement um, in the future so that 
I can have a better understanding, uh, you know, about what's what's happening, please. Billy, we can get you that information. Yes, ma'am. We'll give it to the entire board. Okay. Thank you. And if you need to look back, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you need to look back, the Citizens Oversight page that uh, Ms. Gray referenced lists what it has happened. We've got planned, our 24 projects have already been planned and already ordered for next summer. Our 25, we actually advertise in October of this year. That's our advance. So we can tell you exactly what big project. That's over $4 million. That's not any of the smaller ones, but we'll make sure we get that to all the board members. Thank you, Member President. I just wanted to say thank you because sometimes if there's an, a, an issue with the school, sometimes I don't know the background, if it's just been fixed or where we are in that. So I think that's a great suggestion. I also want to thank, you know, Ben Moore and Mr. Otero. I mean, it is, you know, my air went out and it took a day in my house to come out. So I, you, all of you work very hard. And I know, like you said, one classroom is too much, but we just have to continue working towards that. Thank you. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. We will now move to employee comment, and thank you employees. We're, I try to really make sure we're about four minutes over. I know your time is very important. Even though we hear from public comment at the beginning of the meeting, it is sometimes difficult for employees of our district to attend meetings at 4 p.m. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard, including through union representatives, emails, phone calls, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we're creating another avenue for employees to speak to the board. We're setting aside 30 minutes for employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on your mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about specific agenda items on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or the district. Each speaker will have three minutes. Uh, the first speaker will please come up. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everyone. Rob Creed, CTA. At CTA, you know, we're protecting our schools against privatization, and we appreciate all your help with that. And with that, we need to make sure that we're staffing our schools properly. Uh, and as board members, you guys do a phenomenal job of having conversations with employees while you're out there. So please continue to do that. When th They love seeing you at the sites. They love talking to you about what's going on in the schools, what's good, and even some things that they would like to do a little bit better. So have a, do a little market research out, when you're out there about what teachers really want, how we can be creative when we're at, like, at the bargaining table. So um, we, we appreciate everything you're doing. We know that you guys will be meeting soon. Um, one of the things that I would talk about is the compression that we see in our salary schedules, and that's something that we are – actively working and collaborating with the district and you guys on and trying to fix when teachers come in and they're going to make that same salary for the same you know seven years it tells them that really they don't it's dead end they, they don't want to stick around we got to figure out, out a way to fix that when our support professionals come in and they're going to make fifteen dollars for fifteen years before they see a raise we have to do something about that and then on the other end of the scale we got to see what we could do at the top because when people look at the salary schedules they're looking at both parts what is it going to look like year to year and where can I really end up? So these are things that we want to look at creatively and collaboratively with you. And that's something that's part of our proposal. So we're looking forward to getting back to the table and getting this done soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello. Uh, good to see you all again. Uh, my name is Emily Greist. I teach at Riverview High School. I uh, hope you all had a good summer. Uh, I know I did. I got the opportunity to get away and see some of the pieces I teach in AP Art History and was very lucky to get to actually share that experience with a couple students who also happen to travel to see uh, artworks. But they're not the ones I am here to talk about today. Uh, one group of co my colleagues that didn't get a chance to get away for the summer like I did was uh, my friends who are paraprofessionals in our schools. Uh, many of them spent the summer working long, hot hours in our schools with, I know we were just talking a lot about air conditioning, but yeah, long, hot hours in our schools. Uh, many of them have to do this just to be able to make ends meet. As Rob just mentioned, our paraprofessionals, many of them, almost, the majority of them are making $15 an hour. And as I heard you guys mention earlier, that's really not a living wage in Tampa. Um, so I teach an access class, personally. 
Um, these paras have saved my life on a regular basis. Uh, right now, I have 18 access kids in my room with a wide range of abilities. And the paras are the ones that really help me keep my classroom orderly. They're making sure it's a safe place for everybody to be in and that the students are doing their best on the project that we're currently working on. Uh, these paras put up with all kinds of student behaviors, including being hit, being kicked, and having bodily fluids thrown at them all on a regular basis. Uh, these are the hardest working people I know at my school. Um, and I would like to see them get compensated for the amazing work that they do. Uh, they, the pay scale for the paras right now doesn't appropriately compensate for experience or for the difficulty of the job. Uh, I have one parent at my school currently who uh, is a severe health risk, and she was working with a student who was throwing bodily fluids, and with a new spike in COVID, she's worried uh, for her safety on the job right now. Uh, our paras are absolutely essential to our schools, uh, and I'm asking on behalf of my friends who are paraprofessionals and my colleagues that are paraprofessionals, uh, and those people that are irreplaceable in my classroom, that they're compensated fairly for their expertise and provided a living wage for their work. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great night. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello. My name is Rachel Rodriguez, and I work at Hillsborough High School. I have lived in Tampa for my entire life, born and raised here in the Hillsborough County public school system. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I've been back in my classroom for exactly four weeks today meaning I have been in a classroom averaging 82 to 84 degrees every day since then. By OSHA suggestions, this goes way over no more than 76 degrees. Today, my worst nightmare almost came true. I thought I was going to witness two of my students passing out in my classroom today. And I, I was terrified. I have one kid in mind who has a health risk. The students that I was worried about today, normal kids trying to learn. But I have one student in mind that I know if they were there in that moment, I don't know that they would have been okay. My administration has been so incredibly supportive of my unique position with my room. There is no other room designed for the needs of my class. Therefore, it's not an easy fix to just move me somewhere else. I've come to my admin with a possible solution, which they gladly have forwarded to the appropriate parties in the county. They also agree that this is absolutely necessary, not only for the comfort, but the safety of my students. This is no common issue. My students cannot wait weeks to months for a reply, nor for action to happen. My classroom has an extra storage closet that I have proposed to be used to install a second air handler to, uh, since my room is technically the square footage of two full rooms. At this time, the current AC unit I have cannot keep up with this unprecedented heat coming through my 40 feet of windows that face east, along with how much space it is trying to compensate. I'm terrified of one or more of my students facing the consequences of unsustainable learning environments. My classroom feels like one of them right now. For the safety and the sake of my kids, can we please find a way to rectify this now instead of months from now? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's been a while since I've been able to get up here, but I'm glad to see that I think our meetings are back kind of they were hijacked for a while from certain groups of folks, and I think we're back on track and really focused on education, so that's really good. Um, uh, I am a teacher at Bernie Elementary in Plant City and my school's CTA rep. Uh, this past year, teachers from all levels uh, spent time poring over our contracts and meeting in subcommittees, subcommittees so that our bargaining team could come up with things that meet needs at all levels for all teachers. Bargaining has been underway through the summer and now into another school year. While I do understand there's some time issues related to budgets and things of that nature, I implore the district and board not to allow negotiations to go on through the school year again with the teachers waiting in limbo. CTA has proposed many things in both 
language and pay scale that could address some of our issues related to the crisis that we all know exists with the shortage of teachers and school staff. We've seen people leaving the profession at an alarming rate, and it's time to start compensating the people that have stood the test of time and keep sticking it out. Many of those that are still here are on the fence. They're really examining their options as the next few years unfold. They're still looking at other districts around us. They're still looking outside of the field for other things to explore. They're looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. They need to see promise and proof that they can make a consistent living in this profession and support their families while serving our students. Teachers in this county are witnessing the district spend possibly millions to pay subcontracted teachers at a higher rate than the existing employees here. Cancel the contracts, dump the money into the pay scale, increase the pay scale steps to ease the compression for ESPs and teachers, and watch your vacancies disappear. Please remember also that the people that come to speak are a very small representative of the teachers that are not able to make it down here. They're working second jobs, they're taking trainings, they're coaching teams, or maybe just decompressing at home because there is no tired like teacher tired. Let's invigorate our teachers and school staff by finally paying them, us, what we are worth. And with the little bit of time that I do have to address some of like the parents and things that came with SEL, we have mandated minutes set by the state for reading, writing, and arithmetic, like all the folks like to say. No one has taken those minutes away. We are still teaching the mandated minutes for reading, writing, math, and all of our other core subjects. SEL and, and teaching children to be good character has never taken away from core instruction in the past, now, or any other time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, I'm Kim Henriquez from Lowry Elementary. Kindergarten. I said I wasn't gonna cry, I'm really trying hard. I'm gonna give you some numbers in our kindergarten classes. 29, 28, 28, a 21, but that's a kicks class, kindergarten inclusion. In those classes, there are six children with IEPs. And we have one kindergarten aide. We have one teacher that took a medical leave um, and we replaced her. And then we had another teacher that had an opportunity to teach in a private school and they met her salary. And I don't blame her, it's a, it was a family decision. So now we've been waiting to hire somebody to fill that position. Our, my our administration has been amazing. Um, Ms. Bagnola was a former kindergarten teacher, so she's been, she knows, she gets it. And she's working really hard. We've had a substitute come in and just float. Um, <laughs> kindergarten is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. And we've got some challenges this year. It's, it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's been, this has been the toughest year. This is my 30th year. It's hard. My forever fiance of 20 years had a heart attack the week school started. So that's been hard. He wants me to quit. <laughs> I don't really want to. But I'm just at my wit's end. I'm working 14 hour days. I go in at 5.30, I leave at 7.30. You wanted to know about testing in kindergarten? The pool is on September the 6th. That teacher, if we even get somebody, you know what the situation is, if we, get somebody, she starts, or he starts, on this, at the 11th. We start to star testing in kindergarten, fourth through the eighth, at the same time simultaneously doing Dibbles testing, which is an individual test where you have to pull each kid individually. Star testing you can do in a group. I'm just, you know, the safety is, 
is my main thing. We need another, if we're going to have these big class sizes, we need another adult in that room just to be safe, just to help them use the bathroom. I mean, it's just, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening to our elected school board members and our current superintendent. My name is Heidi Glick and I am a teacher in Hillsborough County. I also live in Hillsborough County. I vote in Hillsborough County. My kids went to Hillsborough County Public Schools and I am very, very concerned about some of the rumors I am hearing right now. As a matter of fact, some of them are just downright scary. Rumor has it that although there will be no teacher cuts, in other words, those of us that are currently employed will be continued to be employed. However, we don't know where we're going to be placed. Rumors have it that teachers will be put, will be told that they have to move from their classes, move from their schools, maybe leave their children behind, worry about daycare, worry about transportation, worry about rush hour traffic, new distances to work because of numbers. Let me remind you that at the lockdown drills that have been happening all over the county, no one has a safe corner. No one has a safe corner in their room. They're all filled with desks. In high schools, our classes are 35 to 40, even some above 40. Some teachers teaching the required six classes have 220 students or more. I can't even imagine. We just heard some of the things that are happening in elementary schools. I, I can't even imagine. If our goal is the smallest classes possible to educate our students, that's our priority. But if teachers are being moved, relationships are going to be destroyed, the safety of every single student in this school district is at issue. I know that we're trying to hire people, and I know that no one is applying. So this salary scale is a major reason why no one is applying. But I need you to set these rumors aside. I need you at some point tonight to let everyone know what is happening? People don't know. People are scared. People are talking about quitting. People are talking about resigning. People are talking about leaves. That's just going to mean larger and larger classes. We need to know what's happening. We need to know when it's going to happen. And you need to be, my favorite word of the week, transparent. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Melissa Lee Stevens. I'm a proud to be a beginning fifth year teacher teaching exceptional student education for science here at the land of the mighty tigers, George S. Middleton, Middle, George S. Middleton High School, where I also serve as an ELP tutor after school as well as an HCTA representative. Middleton is a historically school with a long established history of graduating student citizens who go on to proudly serve our county despite the modest economic and environmental resources within our impoverished Title I communities. We have a proud community who embraces our struggles. We seek to overcome so very many things that are out of our control. Our students face significant frequency of entering high school requiring level three services for academic supports. They require significant support with intensive instruction to accelerate their skills to be in line for success. And how are we supported? Our principal's amazing, our administration is amazing, but we're facing staff and faculty cuts each and every year that I have taught. Our enrollment historically leans to, to 1,500 students, 1,550, with a current enrollment of 1,540. Typically, enrollment surges another 100 after Labor Day. We only have 85 teachers. Four additional teacher positions are advertised for reading, English, biology, and chemistry, and our classes are swelling in size. What concerns will the fire department have, fire marshal have expressed whenever they see our classes designed to seat 30 students with five or 10 additional students in the room? Now we're looking at losing nine additional teachers, 10%. Our teachers are diligently trying to accommodate these larger numbers, maneuvering seats for issues. We have struggled to effectively circulate to give proximity, assistance, support, and check-in for each of those students while providing additional control 
to help reduce behaviors and support classroom management and maintain academic progress. And how big are our classes, especially for those struggling to meet the benchmarks for graduation? Intensive reading is 39. Senior reading number four is 30 students. Math College Liberal Arts, 35, 36, 37 students. One teacher. OSHA recommends 24 in building construction. We maintain 29. Barbering recommends 24. We have 34. Teachers must build rapport with students. They try being our English teacher with 185 writing students. Credit recovery supports our struggles, struggling students, and they support over 200 students with class sizes of 36, 37, 38, held so low because we have eight periods compared to the seven periods that other teachers have. History has 183 students, world history 40, U.S. history 39, U.S. government 36, or Spanish thank you. has 268. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. And that concludes our comment, our employee comments. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to 1001. There's Searcy Dinix Symphony Integrated Library System Software. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Chair Combs. So this is our Symphony Integrated Library System, um, and this is to purchase the license for that software package. Uh, Symphony is used by the district to manage library resources, including the lending of books and tracking of materials and catalogs. Uh, the district has used Symphony for at least the last seven years. Thank you. Thank you. I need a motion a second to approve item C-1001. I have a motion by member Vaughn, and I have a second by Member Gray. Also, I, before I move on, I just want to say that um, we do have our chief of schools in the back talking to a lot of the employee inputs. I don't, I don't want people to not think that is not being addressed. Well, and during my superintendent yes. comments, so yes, I'll have okay. A I, I just wanted to make sure that that people know that the people are being addressed in the back since they're not able to see them. Thank you. Sorry for that, um, Member Vaughn. You pulled a uh, member Vaughn and member Han. And Member Rendon, you pulled this item. Start with. Okay. Member Rendon. Oh, did we do? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Well, me too. <laughs> um, okay, we'll start with you, Member Hahn. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I had uh, many of my questions answered, so I greatly appreciate that. Um, again, just like a previous contract, my concern is always around when we have multi-year contracts. And, you know, um, I, always, I always like to, you know, have a touch point before a contract renews. I think this was a three-year renewal after, or two years after this initial approval. Um, so that's, that's my concern, you know, is that, again, this, this auto renews. And I know it, it tends to lock in a price for those amount of years, but what I've witnessed over the years is typically that when it comes back for renewal, there's a hike that actually makes up for the lost revenue over the locked in price over the last three years. So um, either way, there you know you you end up really not getting a great deal. Um, so that that's really my concern, and just that um, you know I know we talked a little bit about this during the workshop potentially having um, an opt-out form for books whether that does or does not come to fruition um, you know it did concern me that this system does not have that ability to um, you know add that so which would make it easier for librarians if a you know if the book was scanned and it automatically popped up on the screen that there was an opt-out so you know, um, I, I'm going to ask to have, depending on that conversation, you know, that, that that's just was a concern down the road. But that can be addressed if we get to that point as a board. So thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Rendon? You know, I really want to thank the department um, and the district staff for really taking their time and their diligence around this issue of library issues. Um, you know, one of my concerns is as we've had recent legislation that's been passed, it's kind of made it um, some issues within our library system and making sure that, 
you know, we look out for our uh, media specialists, our teachers in their classroom libraries, and really making sure that the DOE is providing support to us as local districts. And so one of the things I'm very thankful for was, you know, um, our district staff made sure that we had the information brought to our attention that the Department of Education themselves has gone out for a um, RFI regarding a um, requesting information for qualified vendors and transition to a commercial off-the-shelf software application that will provide districts, parents, and public access to review educational resources, instructional material, and library materials used in district and in schools. I think it's very important to know that our district is on top of it. Our district has been in communication with the DOE on that status of that information and are directly working together. And we are currently waiting for that information to come back from the DOE so we can move forward to make sure. One of the other things that's very hopeful is that the program that they're looking for is going to align with a system that we currently have in place. So if we are putting out funds today for a library system, this will go and it will be a companion to that, which is very important, I think, for our district staff, our district teachers, um, our parents, and our community members to understand that the DOE is in process of looking at software that's going to be a partner with the software we already have currently right now. And so we are waiting on that transition from the DOE. So thank you so much for providing us all the information and keeping up with everything that the district as well as the state is doing. Thank you, Member Rundin. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. We will now move to superintendent comments. Superintendent Ayers. There it, is. there it is, thank you Madam Chair. So first off I wanna address uh, some of the comments um, made regarding some of our class sizes. So first off to our teachers that are still here, thank you for, for being here, we're listening. We are following our normal process for looking at right now, um, today we have our day nine enrollment, looking at our schools that are over enrolled, some of our schools are under enrolled, um, and making sure our regional superintendents are working um, as we speak to make sure that our class sizes are appropriate. Um, so thank you, number one, for being here. That is not something that, that, that I want to hear, um, but I know that we, are, we will work diligently to make sure that all those, all those um, issues are addressed. So I appreciate you taking the time to be out here. That is not, um, as a school district, we create conditions for our, student, for our schools to be successful. So we are working, um, like I said, as we speak to make sure that we create those conditions. Um, and this follows our board on normal process leading up from day five of counts. We look at our schools that um, are over-enrolled, some are under-enrolled, and make those necessary adjustments. But um, class sizes of 40, um, that is not something that, that we, myself, this board, this cabinet will tolerate. Um, so thank you for coming out. We're listening, and we'll address that right away. So thank you. So um, some of my comments, so this is our first uh, board meeting since the first day of school, believe it or not. I was talking to some of our team members, it seems like the first day of school was like two months ago, but no, <laughs> it, was, it was nine days ago. So this is uh, nine days ago, our first day of school, we had a tremendous opening. I want to thank um, all of our instructional team, our instructional support, administrators, like I've told um, my team. Having a great first day like that doesn't just happen, right? It's all the preparation, the work from everybody. You hear me say everyone matters. You don't have an opening like that without an entire team of people that are working, and that's from our instructional support, our instructional team, our teachers, our administrators. We got we got your back. We're all in this together. We're going to ensure that this that this trend continues, um, and that we are addressing any concerns that you have. But um, first day of school, I just want to thank our entire our entire team. Um, you know, here we are, day nine now, but but thank you to everyone for making our first day of school. There's nothing like the first day of school, and uh, it was a special one um, in Hillsborough County. So around our strategic plan, uh, support of organizational culture, just want to highlight a few things. Um, so pep rally at Brandon High School. Brandon on their, I think it was their second day of school, already had a pep rally. Um, I saw it all over social media, but Jeremy and his team, the teachers out there, they had a cool pep rally um, for the second day of school. Great things happening over at Brandon. And Lomax Elementary, just a sampling. I just some, set, you know, sampled one of them, but this happened all over the district. You can see our kindergarten clap-in happening over at Lomax. So I just wanted to highlight some of that. So take a look here. So this is our Dunbar Elementary School principal. Um, 
This is the her. We had a, um, some rain, some flooding there. This is our principal. Um, this was posted by one of our school counselors, and our school counselor, his name uh, is Dwayne Davis, actually posted this of, of Miss Krim um, walking across, carrying one of the kindergarten students across the road, and he posted, "If your school principal isn't this dedicated to the children, you know, I don't want her." So <laughs> it was. Um, but I just want to. Um, this this goes to show how you know we're all in this. We're all in this together. So. Um, just wanted to highlight that for Cynthia. That was on some social media there. Um, academic excellence. One of our consent agenda items was around our Embry-Riddle uh, partnerships. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, one of the consent agendas was around our, our Aeronautical University Aerospace Career Ac Academy partnership, which allows our 50 students to be enrolled in dual enrollment courses. So we've got 50 students that you know, enrolled in dual enrollment and will also pursue industry certifications. And that's uh, Jefferson, Robinson, and Steinbrenner. You can see some pictures there. Um, we talked a lot about fiscal and operational responsibility today, from fuel to our air conditioners. I just wanted to, and, and Member Vaughn had also mentioned it, our team, we kind of wanted to show the behind the scenes look of, of, air, of our team of maintenance workers and who's actually, you know, we, we talk about our ACs, but there's people behind that that are working extremely hard. And I talked about Hillsborough Strong and our team, our team of people that are working every day to ensure that, you know, the, that our, um, con, our conditions, our classrooms are comfortable for all of our teachers and students. Um, I think we all agree it's been, you know, I've been here my entire life. I've never felt this record uh, amount of heat. Um, so it put a tremendous strain on our on our systems. Um, but I do want to um, thank Mr. Farkas, again, your team, um, for, for all of their work. And, um, you know, we talked about that um, sales tax referendum. Um, the five years that we've put in, I can't imagine without those dollars what that would have been like this first day of school had we not put in all those all those monies into fixing our air conditioners. So shout out to um, all of our taxpayers for assisting our school district um, and our citizens oversight team as well in making sure these projects get completed. So I just want to share a, a video and Member Vaughn mentioned it. So I just want to it's about a two minute video which kind of shows the behind the scenes look as as our team um, prepares and, and makes sure that all of our classrooms are um, ready for school. So with this unprecedented heat, we are dealing with a lot of smaller outages, a lot of major outages. My team is working daily to resolve them as quick as possible. Um, I got a lot of my team starting early, as early as 4.30, 5 in the morning, trying to identify the areas that are down, trying to get a team out there, trying to get those areas up as soon as possible so it's comfortable for when the teachers arrive and then even more comfortable for when the kids arrive. We have over 28 million, 29 million square feet. Um, of conditioned space. So you take a swath of any neighborhood, you're gonna have a lot of issues. You're gonna have a lot of sites that are down. Um, and it's just trying to get those issues resolved, trying to get them fixed quickly um, so they don't have impact to the learning environment. So we receive an MR from a site that something is down. They um, then triage that remotely. And if we're able to fix it remotely, we do. If not, a technician is dispatched as soon as possible. We try to do every means we can. Sometimes it may not seem like we're getting there quick enough, um, but we're doing all our due diligence. You know, I treat all the students as theirs of my own. You know, I try to teach each and every one of them. Uh, I see little Johnny's head sweating, you know, like mine is now. Try to get it resolved as quick as we can. Uh, like I say, whether it's us or the contractor, the vendors, whatever. But when you get through and you get it fixed, uh, you could do anywhere from one call a day to five to nine to 12, you know. Sometimes it's on a computer, sometimes it's just fixing, them, uh, fixing a couple of them. By, by your hands but um, it does take a personal role when you get home and your daughter's air conditioner was out and someone else came and fixed it you know so it is a personal thing we, if we can't get it we get one of our vendors to here our department is uh, as, as is kind of small but we're mighty you know <laughs> just know that that my team is working as hard as they can to resolve these issues and working as hard as they can to provide that comfortable learning environment a safe learning environment for for all our occupants that's our goal and it's our mission and you know we work really hard and we, we do care and I want everyone to know that it's important to us. So I just want to thank uh, so Ms. Arja. So unprecedented. Oh, so I just want to thank Ms. Arja, um, you and your team are working with, with Chris's team to kind of get the behind the scenes look of, of, of our people. We talk about Hillsborough Strong and you heard Brian there, um, one of our you know AC maintenance workers treating every, every child 
as if they're his own, right? And that's that's what makes us. That's what it's about is treating everyone as if they're own. And I just want to shout out again. Thank you, Miss Arjun, for your team, Chris. Um, Thank you for your team, for all that you've done, Ben and Kenny, um, in ensuring that we have the best possible conditions. Because in the end, I'll say it again, it's up to us up here to create those conditions where our teachers can, can get to work. Um, suspended agenda. Um, I'm gonna. We do have a, a just elementary update. I'm gonna toss that, toss this update over to, to Mr. Young. Thank you, Superintendent Ayers. <clears throat> uh, today, the task force visited Cornerstone Family Ministries, Rosetta <clears throat> Valdez Early Learning Center and Lab School. The task force conducted early learning developmental walks to observe the Frog Street curriculum and implementation as a possibility for the future Just Elementary School. We had the opportunity to observe the Head Start curriculum and implementation, along with VPK instruction and a robust PBIS system as a possibility. Um, I want to thank um, the executive director, Kathy Stone, and Janetta Hort-Smith. And equally, I just want to take an opportunity to thank the task force. Um, the task force has been very intentional uh, on pushing uh, the school district, uh, myself and Ms. McCray, uh, to maintain a level of urgency and to be intentional with our engagement. And as a result, uh, they have demands for us. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing about transparency. It gives us an opportunity to showcase um, that we are collaborative in the process and that we do hear the community's voice. Uh, so today, the focus was on early childhood learning and um, the walkthrough today at, at uh, Rosa Valdez, our early learning center, was a great opportunity for community folks to actually see the Frog Street curriculum and the possibilities of what that might look like uh, at a just elementary uh, in the future. Thank you, Mr. Young. Um, so just in closing my comments, I just want to go back to the to the earlier teacher comments and just once again reiterate, uh, my chief of schools, Superket, was already back there working with some of the teachers back there. We are on uh, these issues and uh, making sure that we have uh, the right environment for all of our for all of our students every day, all of our students and teachers. So um, thank you, Sue, for all your work and all your regional superintendents' work as we go to uh, make sure that all of our class sizes are where we expect them to be. So thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Ayers. And we will now begin with board comments. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Superintendent, I would like to know uh, what is the status of just, what are they being used for this year? Yeah, I can toss that over, Mr. Young. So current status of just, if you want to provide an update, sir. Thank you, Superintendent Ayers. So right now, um, it was important for us to identify what just would be used for in the short term. Of course, you do know that the State D Department requires the school dist district to declare uh, usage. So uh, based on need, we identified a homeless education and literacy program uh, to occupy just uh, so that it would take the pressure of, off of us of having to act so quickly to define and identify what just would be as we move forward. So right now we're being covered because it is being occupied by a district office. Uh, and I think even more so just looking at the need in the transition of West Tampa and the homelessness uh, within that area. There have been many, many studies that suggest to us as a school district that there may be a gap uh, that we could fill uh, to ensure that those families who are tra transitioning out and who are still there uh, has an opportunity to have access to some of the services that we provide uh, through the uh, through the McKinney uh, Vento Homeless Education uh, Program. So it is there currently act, uh, occupying the space. The other good piece about it uh, is with the building being vacant, it gives us an opportunity to have a warm body uh, at the site. It gives us an opportunity to continue to check on uh, those facility operational uh, concerns and or the effectiveness effectiveness of those systems. Uh, so just having a warm body there, the other piece in just engaging the task force and sort of tying it in uh, is to identify other short-term usage that the community, that will serve the community. Uh, right now, I think after-school programs and tutoring has been something that has come up uh, as a possibility. Uh, and equally, it gives us an opportunity to, to slow down but to maintain our urgency uh, in identifying what the long-term uh, usage of just elementary would, will look like. 
where we have uh, this year, where we have possibly to have any wraparound services there? So uh, Ms. McCray and I had an opportunity to talk with some resources that accompanies the uh, Homeless Education Program. And it's uh, ironic that you may ask about the wraparound service because I do understand that there are uh, there is money there that may, be, may allow us the opportunity to engage the, the community with some resources to uh, put a program like that in place. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pablo, we're going to skip that. We're going to skip those uh, movies today because I have some shaky, some shaky in the give out up here. Um, first of all, I like, I like for parents to understand as well as the community. You know, we have limited powers as a school board. And, and sometimes I think the parents and the community think we can do miracles. Um, I had a couple of parents to approach me not too long ago say, well, you need to go over there and tell that principal what to do. We don't have an authority to tell a principal what to do. We only have two people that we're really in charge of, and that's the superintendent and the school board attorney. Am I right or wrong? Right. So we don't have the power to go tell a deputy or a chief what to do as school board members. And I like for the community and, the, and my uh, constituents to understand that. Now, we can, if something happens, we go to the superintendent, or if we see one of the deputies or one of the chief, we could say, could you check on this for us? That's what we do, because they're under the uh, impression that we can move mountains, and we really don't have the power to move mountains. I had more power as an area superintendent than I did, than I do now, because I had 34 schools I could tell what to do. And now I only have two people, and we really can't tell them what to do you, if, if you, because you really need four votes to tell them what to do. Shakeism. Let's move on. Uh, we um, we um, have to work as a team, and we are working as a team. Here's Brother Scrum. I love it. We are working as a team so we can make this a better district than it's ever been before. No matter what we do, people, we have to understand, no matter what we do, somebody always will be upset. But we have to do the very best that we can for students. And it's all about students. And let's not, let's not lose that perception. Sometimes you lose it and you start going off, kind of going off in the deep end. But we're here about students. Every, every, every section of our school district is about students. May it, be, may it be Mr. Fargus, may it be the deputies, whatever, we're here about students. Now, I want parents to understand, we, we are working as hard as we can to be successful in this school district. I don't think any board member up here is sitting here saying, well, we ain't going to do that. We all work hard. We have districts, and we also have countywide people, and we work hard. Because we work as a team. We may not always agree, but that's life. You don't always agree with your husband or your wife, because that's life. But what we can do, we can disagree and come up and still be successful. And I think we are working as hard as we can. And I want people to understand that. And I, I think it's so important. And I, I want to say my last, and, and in closing, you know, um, we have people that no matter what we do, they're not going to be satisfied with the board. They're not. They're not going to be satisfied with the, with the superintendent. They're not going to be satisfied with the, with the district itself. But the only thing I can tell you, we are, we, are, we are working really hard. This is one of the better times in my life I feel that we are on top of things and we are working in the right direction. I really do feel that. I really feel we got the right people in place. And, I, and, and the people that we have in place is really working hard these first couple of days of school. And that's all we can do. That's all we can do is work hard. So I want to thank you all for all that you are doing now. And board, no matter who, no matter what happens, we, we stick together. We're going to stick together and we're going to get through this no matter what happens. Thank you, Madam Chair. And by the way, that was shakeism. I'm glad I don't have to follow the shakeism. Okay, Member Gray. <laughs> It's grayism, I guess. We, but uh, but thank you, um, Member Washington, um, for the heartfelt expressions and uh, and and response to the need for us to work as a team. I uh, wanted to uh, uh, also share the Nope um, event schedule that Kathy Valdez and her Nope team 
have put through our school system, um, and these events, of course, um, are regarding the narcotics um, misuse and what a what a great event they show. It impacts our middle and high schools. So I, um, I'm hoping we all can take one or two schools to visit. Um, second, I, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> Superintendent Ayers, I know that we're having a workshop on October 10th regarding the properties and uh, and the impact fees are, is the subject I'd like to have included. Um, and as uh, Mr. Farkas, thank you for giving me that invita uh, uh, information. Um, <clears throat> the impact fees, when we had it, and just correct, it was, uh, correct me, 2019, we had a, I, I believe it was for a $200,000 home, um, an estimated amount of $3,000. And then now we raised it. Um, you know, a few of us got together uh, with um, with BOCC and we raised it to eight thousand successfully in the Tampa Home Builders Association. Uh, but uh, Chris, give us the actual it, fundamental impact fees that we're having now. Sure, it's based on the size of the home, so it's two thousand square feet. Which right, two thousand. Two thousand. It was four thousand, just under four thousand dollars for a two thousand square foot home. And now it's just at eight thousand dollars on a on a two thousand square foot home, and that was done, like you said, right in the two thousand nineteen two thousand twenty school year. Yeah, and previous to that we were the lowest, um, probably the lowest out of all the sixty seven districts. So, it and the reason I mention this, uh, board members, is because we're acquiring property. Um, we got a good deal, fifty acres, um, right next to Stingray, uh, and that's in Plant City area. We had another purchase. Um, another 50 acres, I'm hoping I'm saying it correct, but we're using a lot of the impact fees. So it's important that we understand that's a, that's a real great revenue source for us acquiring properties and building schools. So I'd like to see, um, Superintendent, um, uh, Ayers that we put on the suspended agenda, the amount of money that we are getting and or, um, Ms. Johnson, that we're getting from impact fees. I think the board needs to know quantitatively that that's an asset, a revenue source. I also want, uh, and I talked to um, Ms. Johnson a while ago, and I heard it tonight from one of the constituents, that we do need to have the, the amount of FTE loss monetarily from the students that are now going. I know we had to wait till the 10-day count, which I guess is tomorrow. I'm not sure if we already had it. But we need to have that loss that's shown indicative of the private, of the homeschool and the charter schools, because that's another, no, it's not a revenue uh, plus, it's a revenue loss. But I, I do believe the public needs to have that information. And I, quite frankly, I'll just speak for myself, I'd like to know also. So I'd like to see that, those figures on the suspended agenda uh, and or on your financial report that you share. Um, a big thank you to our wonderful Jessica de la Prida in charge of the, she, she took complete charge of the bilingual, um, <clears throat> volunteers that showed up to over, I think around 46 schools helping with the, um, registration for our Hispanic families. And she organized it to a point of, uh, I mean, it grew from just, uh, uh, two, maybe 20 something schools. This year we did 46, maybe more. So thank you, Jessica de la Prida, and thank you to our partners, uh, including Achieva Bank, City of Tampa, Congress, uh, well, Mayor, uh, Congress member Kathy Castor, Early Learning Coalition, Enterprising Latinas, Hispanic Services, Latinx Community, Guidance Counselors, um, Hillsborough Committee, PDAC Parents, Univision, um, FACE, that's our family and community engagement, and psychological services, and just recently, USSA. Uh, they all came and said, how can we help bridge the communication, the language gap for registration? And uh, we are still having those uh, wonderful volunteers. So um, also, let's see how my time's doing. Uh, so we're having tomorrow a panel, <clears throat> a human trafficking uh, student online safety gathering with the um, Latino Coalition. 
Um, and I'll be speaking, and Superintendent Van Ayers will be speaking. But again, the outreach to the Hispanic families, this is the Hispanic leadership, um, will be shown in terms of the strategies and the nuances of social media, how it's affecting the grooming uh, of our students, possibly, <clears throat> etc. So there's a lot of questions out there. Um, other than that, I guess I'm done. My time's up. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Hahn. Thank you, Member Combs. Uh, it was um, a great first day of school and so much positivity and really uh, don't remember such a great first day since my first year on the board. So um, that really has a lot to do with your leadership, Superintendent Ayers. Just in the short time you've been in the position, it's had a major impact and you could really see that when you went out to schools the first day. Um, there was kind of a lightness and excitement about it. Um, I want to thank the Hillsborough Early Learning Coalition. Um, two years now we've partnered on a first day of kindergarten initiative where um, they have gifted every kindergarten teacher in the district with the book Planet Kindergarten, which is a really fun book that, yeah, that just, um, you know, kind of is a fun way to prepare your child or your student for the first day. And, and it really, um, you know, talks about kindergarten being an adventure within this idea that, you know, you're going off on this great adventure and all these great things are going to happen. So um, every kindergarten teacher received a book thanks to the generosity of the Hillsborough Early Learning Coalition. And <clears throat> um, I went out to Sheramonte. That was one of, only, one of the schools I visited on the first day, and I was able to read the book to a few of the kindergarten classes. So that was a lot of fun. I recorded the story, um, a video recording, and we pushed that out to families before the first day of school. And um, so that way they could watch it with their child, and then if the teacher chose to read it on the first day of school. So, um, you know, that's, that, that's been a really fun project to do with the ELC. So I hope that we continue to do that while I'm on the board, and I hope it continues long after that. Because um, that is, I mean, I, I even remember my first day of kindergarten. Um, I think a lot of people, no. When I was five years old, <laughs> I do remember the first day and how exciting it was. But honestly, every first day of school is always exciting. And even as a teacher, there's just something about it's a fresh start, you know. that. And there's very few times in life where you get a fresh start. And so um, I hope everyone has a great school year. But I want to... You know, I visited a lot of great schools um, in my district on that day, and it was just great to see all the kids back and and talk with the parents and the teachers and the principals. And I think it's going to be a great year of school. I think there's a lot of really great things happening in our schools that, you know, don't always get talked about at school board meetings. And so I really hope we can all be the, um, great ambassadors for this district when we're out in the community just sharing some of the positive things. Every district is going to have challenges. In an organization this large, um, it's expected. But I think there's more positives than negatives, and I, I hope we can all be, and I know we are all great ambassadors when we go out into the community and we share that. So um, thank you all. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Vaughn. Thank you. Um, first of all, to all of our teachers, admins, our staffs, employees, I just want to say welcome back. Thank you for coming back. Um, I concur. It's been a really great, you know, first week and a half of school. Um, I've been really busy. I've actually been going out to all of our local PTAs on their first night and really talking with parents about the importance of our PTAs and expressing the appreciation and gratitude for that partnership because I think that we don't talk enough about how our PTAs really support our school and how important those relationships are. Um, and just interacting with parents in different communities and seeing, you know, what their concerns are. And I just, I want to say thank you to all of our PTA volunteers and presidents and members who do so much for our schools. Um, I, it's been an interesting week. I've gotten a lot of feedback about our cell phone policy from both educators, uh, pr our proposed cell phone policy, from both educators and parents. So I look forward to having more discussion about that now that we've had some time to get some feedback because um, I've learned quite a few things from, from different perspectives. Um, I did want to just kind of highlight um, 
there were some concerns and questions about start times. I know that with the new legislation, some other districts are really struggling to change their start times. I think it didn't affect us very much, but for like uh, K through eight, which start time are they using? So you're correct, Ms. Vaughn, it doesn't affect us. Uh, K through eight kindergarten start, or the elementary school starts at 7.30. Okay, so the that's pretty much the elementary school start time they adhere to? Okay, and do we have some K-12s for like our exceptional centers or whatnot. What time are we using for those? Say that again. You can. So yeah, most of those, well, there are a couple that are- Dorothy Thomas yes, services. Exactly that part of it too. So they each have a little bit different time. They all don't have standard times based on, on bus schedules, that part of it too. We can get you the actual list of what- But that's not affected by start times. That's where some of the concern is coming from. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, and then, I know we had some definitive answers on the forms around nicknames because there's a lot of questions and concerns about that. I didn't see it as a parent. Has that gone out to our families in, in consideration of how we're complying with state legislation and the state law around that? Yes, ma'am. So this form um, is uploaded on the district website and all schools have access to the form. They're not being handed out to every single student. The law or rule requires us to have them available at the school. So all principals have been spoken to and trained on it and received the form both in English and Spanish. And so I know when we spoke, you had clarified like a shortened version of a full name, like my son is Zachariah, he goes by SAC, didn't require a form, especially since at open house, I had already okayed that with my, my, uh, my, t the teacher. But ha I still have a lot of questions, concerns about that. So can we send out some clarifications just around that? So parents aren't concerned that if their child goes by a shortened term of their nickname, that they have to hunt down a form and find some forms, because I've gotten a lot of anxiety around that. Um, and then just moving forward from there, like I really want to echo the sentiments of my fellow board members, Member Washington and Dr. Hahn. I think that, you know, I'm glad that we have this forum where people can come in and talk about the frustrations. Hearing that only makes us stronger and better. Unfortunately, some of the concerns are not decisions that we as board members make and fall under your leadership or, or other people's leadership. Um, so, so I hope, I think the more that we can explain to people the structure of our board and how decisions are made, that always relieves anxiety and transparency. But I agree, like, we have a great team, great things are happening in our schools. Um, I, I really believe Hillsborough Public Schools are one of the best, we're the best district around. Um, every single day that I go into my schools, I'm amazed by what we can offer our students and, you know, how we take care of them. So I appreciate my fellow board members, you know, just talking about how, while this is an opportunity to always engage with the public about how we can do better, and a lot of people come because they're frustrated, any opportunity we have to talk about the amazing things that our staff and our employees and, and our students and our families are doing all in collaboration um, in a you know collaborative relationship I think is important and so I appreciate everyone talking about that and underscoring it because sometimes that really doesn't make it to to to, to everybody's talking points or that's not the information we hear so Congratulations to everyone who, you know, survived the first eight days. And again, I look forward to uh, the rest of the school year and everything it brings. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Rendon? Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to all of our teachers, our administrators, all of our district staff across the board. Um, what a great way to start the school year. It was knock on wood. It was smooth. It was exciting. Kids were excited to be back. Teachers were excited to be back. Um, it was just an enjoyable day to go school by school. Everyone was excited to be back. And that's just such a testament to the district staff and your leadership as a superintendent. And so um, I just want to take a moment to thank everybody about that. You know, I also want to take a moment to thank our community. Our community really stepped up this year leading up to when the school started. We had so many back to school events. So many of our chambers across the county stepped up to provide um new teachers with just equipping them and thanking them for stepping up to be such a significant impact on our students lives the students have been just impacted across the board with backpacks and school supplies and so thank you to hillsborough county you stepped up in a big way also want to give out a shout out to bernie elementary school where we will be celebrating tomorrow the 100th anniversary of bernie elementary school in Plant City. Those of you who that can come out, um, come out and see what our schools look like. Um, great leadership. 
Oh, Thursday. Sorry. Thursday. You are correct. Thursday. Thursday at 6 o'clock in Plant City. Um, they are doing a phenomenal job out there along with so many other ones of our schools. But, you know, the historical part about our county is just amazing. Hillsborough High School looks absolutely phenomenal. Plant, so many of our schools just got such an uplift. Um, and that, you know, Mr. Farkas, that's a testament to the operations department and everything you put into it over the summer. Um, Brandon High School looks phenomenal with their palm trees and their entrance, their parking lot. And so, you know, taking pride in our schools means we're taking pride in our students. And so we want to make sure our students feel that pride, feel that message of Hillsborough strong. It is so critically important that our parents our students, our teachers, and our administrators feel that we care about what they're doing. We care about what's happening, and we are trying to show that every single day. So thank you again. Um, like our board members say, we only can do what we can do collaboratively as a group, um, and we um, so appreciate the community's feedback and the community's input. Um, but please make sure you take that beyond. So many of our legislators have delegation meetings coming up in the next couple months. Make sure your legislators know what's important to you because they make the laws that we have to follow. So thank you again to everyone for um, such a great start to a great school year. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Press. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Member Rendon, for um, you know speaking to the community. I attended so many backpack giveaways, clothing. It just was amazing to see this community come out and support our students. You know, um, um, Member Washington um, provided, and so you know, not all families look alike. And we have to remember that. And I, I believe as board members, we do. Um, I, uh, Member Washington provided me with some sneakers for a young man. And it wasn't until I went to his home to drop them off that um, I, I found out that it was his older brother who's raising him. And these are situations that we find. But when I dropped off the shoes to him, he, he grabbed the shoes crying and ran into his house but you know these are things these are struggles that are real in our community and so when a community comes out and offers these supports to our families you know they really need them you know i want to thank um, susan valdez for the back to school fair because those are things also that our community needs those um sh those um abilities to be able to get those vac vac vaccinations for their students to be able to come to the schools but also we had um a community back to school bash where we provided those vaccinations for our students as well and it was very well attended um, and I got to say this, you know, as board members, we also do some hand holding for our parents. I had more conversations with Dr. Higman and Matt Romano. I think we became best friends the, <laughs> the first uh, few days before school because parents started panicking, trying to figure out what schools their children were going. And let me tell you, my phone was on blow up um, just the last few days of, before school started. And I was able to attend Ch Child's Elementary for these students getting out those cars. And I, I thought I was going to have to pry their little hands away from their parents because the parents were crying. And it was just amazing to see. And also um, the, car, the pickup at Benito uh, Middle um, at the end of, you know, God bless these, these, these teachers. I mean, the minute that bell rung, we, there was students coming out of all crevices of the school. I don't even know. I didn't realize that the school held that much, that many kids. And I was in shock. I think the, the principal had to move me to the side for a minute because they were coming from everywhere. It was, I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing how many students. And, you know, of course, we all attended Liberty. And it was just great to see. And thank you, um, Member Washington, for um, the, your event at Edlin Temple, um, for what you continue to do for our community. Um, and you do this every year. Um, I just needed to thank you. But, 
you know, um, our community always comes up, and as board members, we always show up. And so thank you, fellow board members, for what you do for this community on, on always. Thank you. Thank you, Member Prez. And welcome back, everyone, all the teachers and all the administrators. Thank you, Member Prez. Um, and I and I also, it was a great start to the school year. I think it was my record. I, I was able to visit seven schools the first day of school and all over the district. And the one thing is the needs, the students are so different. It's amazing going from one part of the county and driving an hour and 20 minutes away and just seeing how unique every part of our district is and I think for me you know I go out to schools often but when you go out in one day and see so many schools it's just a reminder how the needs are so unique in our, in our district um, I wanted to uh, give a shout out this morning um, at Mort Elementary the Children's Home Society of Florida recognized Susan Valdez as a legislator of the year for all her work in community schools and we know the importance of community schools and how that resonates when I talk about going going throughout the, the county. There's some schools where you have 100% PTA, and there's some schools where we're trying to find someone to lead the PTA. So the needs are so unique, and I think the community schools are really the way to support many of our schools who have needs, such as pantries and things of that nature. Um, and, and we continue to talk about, you know, teachers, trying to recruit teachers through the state. I just want to say that USF is alive and well. I'm, I'm thankful to be at the on the USF Dean's Advisory Council for the second year. And the USF campus in, ten, uh, in Tampa had an 11% increase in teachers. We are still so short, but we need to continue pushing that pair to pro. We need to continue finding young people. I know um, Ms. McCray and I talked about the fellows program and being able to cre recruit some young people into our schools through different mentoring programs. We need to continue finding teachers to make sure, because that is really the future. And, and one last thing, I mean, people know that I talk about cell phones a lot. Um, and what that looks like and what that looks like in the future. And I have to say, I am concerned. I'm concerned at what that looks like now, and I'm concerned at what that looks like five, ten years ago. I think five years ago when you walked into high school, you didn't see kids with earbuds. I think you didn't see the things that you're seeing now. And so the big thing is, um, as I'm looking at other districts across the state and what they've done, and Orange County did a really hard hard cell phone policy, but what I read was there was a, a spike, a huge spike in Baker Acts in that county. So to me, in a way, it, it makes me sad. It shows that the addiction and the issues are much deeper than we think. And I can't be here on the board and think, this is, this is my thoughts on cell phones, even though I have a young daughter who graduated. I think we need to really look I, I, I'm, I commend the DOE for making the first hard step in, in working towards cell phones. But um, our chief of school, Superket, I, I talked to you about today. I think I, you know, we need to have, you know, parents, students, principals, community members. We really need to have a, a panel to really discuss this and talk about this and really look before we just have policies that may or may not work in schools, I think we really need to engage the community and see what that looks like. Because my concern is how it's changed so much over the few years. My daughter just graduated from high school. I can tell you the cell phone policy in her ninth grade year changed a lot by 12th grade. Uh, as far as the use and kids watching shows on, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's an epidemic and it's a problem. So I really would like to see some type of event, you know, some type of um, committee to really engage from all different areas to really look at this and see how we can handle this. I know it's handled differently in different schools and, and, it, and I'm excited to go out to those schools to see how it's going. But I think this is a large issue and it's an issue we need to be proactive instead of reactive on it. Um, thank you everyone and I hope you have a great year and this meeting is adjourned.